All right, hello everyone and uh, welcome. Hopefully uh, you can hear me. Sorry, I, uh, I'm a little bit late, but you know how it is. Um, I uh, couldn't find my microphone. Uh, a lot of people said uh, you should buy a new mic with all your Patreon money. I actually did buy a new mic, believe it or not. Um, a really good one. It was one that cost over a hundred uh, hundred pounds. Um, unfortunately, I think it's almost too good for streaming. It's like picking up uh, like the, the internal fan of my computer and things like that. Um, so I've gone back to my older to my older mic, um, and I think that's better, especially when I'm down here in the garage. Uh, then I made a cup of coffee, and in my rush, I ended up spilling the coffee granules all over the kitchen. And obviously I had to clean it up before I came down here. So I've been a little bit delayed uh, due to uh, boomerism essentially in all ways, uh, not just in technology, but in life in general. Um, so uh, where were we? Okay, so I've, I've uh, hopefully everybody can see my little uh, presentation on the right hand side here. Um, because I'm down the garage, I will have a coffee, uh, I will have a, uh, cigar with my coffee and um i i looked through the collection and thought well i don't want to waste a good one which would be good for a cigar stream so i'm going to have a quorum shade uh that's a kind of cheap nicaraguan cigar i think that will do for the purposes of this list so i'm going to light that up now as we get going um a lot of people seem to uh enjoy the uh first uh 60 uh the kind of back half of the uh top 100 um so i'm glad a little bit different from this channel and um it, to cap off non-politics week um i thought uh i would also make my top 100 uh, pc games and then uh, hopefully um i will be able to speak to uh, dr edward dutton on sunday to kick off uh the i guess return of my return of my channel proper Okay, and uh, Edward Dutton very kindly has sent me PDF copies of several of his books, uh, which I'll hopefully I'll get a chance to look at uh, before I speak to him. But anyway, uh, where were we? So first of all, um, Charlemagne said, oh, actually, I was thinking possibly not 100 games, maybe just 50 games. I mean, I could easily give 200 games. You know, I've been gaming since, uh, since the mid-80s, mate. So... Uh, you know, it's not like there's any shortage of them, but maybe I'll just stop at 50. We'll see, because 100 may be a bit of a squeeze in the time I've got left in non-politics week. Uh, oh, <laughs> people are saying, no, do 100, do 100. All right, all right, I'll do 100 then. I tell you what, I might do 100 um, PC get. I might do 50 PC games, 50 like every other console and system ever. And we'll see. We'll see where that takes us. But anyway, uh, where were we here? So, um, uh, yes. So starting off, you can see I've made a new front cover using my uh, using my very limited skills. And um, I think um, uh, where were we here? Uh, yes. Some errata, uh, some mistakes I made uh, in the first uh, in the first part. So, you know, when you're just talking on your own for two hours off the top of your head and in some cases where you haven't seen these films for some time you may make a, a couple of little errors along the way and uh, if my experience on the internet if you make a mistake people are very quick to point it out and i made uh, i made several mistakes um one of them was that uh, i mentioned that uh, i love the smell of napalm in the morning i uh, went during when i was talking about full metal jacket but of course that line is said by Robert Duvall in uh, Apocalypse Now. And as I was saying it, I was thinking, hold on a second, that's a different film, isn't it? But, uh, you know, um, so a lot of people pointed that out. And, uh, yeah, fair, fair cop, that was a mistake. I also mentioned that French Connection was in San Francisco. Uh, but, of course, it's in, it's set in New York. I mean, it's a very New York film. <laughs> um, so that was, a, that was a stupid comment from me. I was probably thinking of Bullet, uh, which is another kind of chase film set in uh, San Francisco. Uh, also, Dirty Harry is a San Francisco film. So um, I don't know. I, again, just um, one of those things that you say in the moment. Um, another thing uh, that was mentioned is that Joe McCarthy had nothing to do with the Hollywood blacklist. That was actually the House of Un-American Activities Committee or the HUAC. Yeah, fair enough. Um, and probably the most 
corrections I got was people saying it's Wolf of Wall Street, not on Wall Street. OK. Um, also, Lee, uh, also uh, a lot of people are asking me, have I deleted my uh, uh, Twitter account? Um, the answer is no. If you want to find me on Twitter, the handle that you need is at the working man 66, as in order 66. <laughs> um, yes, the working man 66 is my new Twitter handle. Uh, if you if you try to find not car king, you will come across an account saying something like Keynesian economics for life. Somebody immediately decided to take the old handle. Um, yes, every once in a while, I do a Doctor Who style regeneration on Twitter. Um, you know, in the past, this has usually come about because I've been banned. But I, you know, um, this time I thought, well, it was time. And there are reasons. There are reasons. Now, if anybody ever sees any screenshots of old Twitter accounts uh, of uh, things, um, I can assure you they were faked and I deny all knowledge. Now, finally, uh, number 70 I missed, and I'll I'll mention that quickly at the top um, before I get going. Now, a couple of things. Um, a lot of people, um, a lot of people said, um, uh, I keep on saying film and not movie. Um, well, I mean, I don't, <laughs> I don't really know what to say about that. Um, well, although I did listen to it back. I, I went on a walk. I took AAA on a walk in a pram and, uh, I, I listened to a good chunk of, uh, of what I did. And, uh, I said movie on a number of occasions. So I think this is a wild rumor. Also, some people claim I, that in my Welsh accent, I say Phil, Phil, like that. Is that, I didn't hear that. I just say Phil, Phil. I, so you've made me very self-conscious about that now. But anyway, I'm going to try to switch it up. You know, move movie. What, what's another phrase? Uh, moving picture, uh, flick. Um, uh, a lot of people said that my review of uh, every single film was, I like this film because it's dark. So I'm going to try as a challenge to go through the rest of tonight without saying it's dark about any of the films, although basically all of them are. Um, and um, somebody asked, what was your number 100 uh, pick before In the Company of Men took the spot at the last minute? The answer is the Powell and Pressburger classic, uh, A Matter of Life and Death, um, which is obviously a better film, like objectively speaking, than most of the films on my list. You know, if you haven't seen A Matter of Life and Death, it's definitely worth watching because um, a guy kind of wrongly goes to heaven and he's put on trial to try to justify his life. Very interesting film. Um, but uh, I thought In the Company of Men, you know, was more fun. And um, will I put up the PDF as well as the Excel? Yes, I will. Both the document I'm looking at now and my master Excel uh, spreadsheet will be made available as shareable Google Drive links, um, basically as soon as this goes off air. And while it's processing, I'll, I'll edit the show notes. OK. All right. Now, let's uh, let's see where we were. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is for those who missed part one very quickly, you know, in the company of men, Purple Rose of Cairo, Lahane, Drive, Straw Dogs, Sideways, Tenerington Place, Heat, woo -ah, uh, Titicat Follies, Suspria, uh, uh, Punch Drunk Love, A School for Scoundrels, The Cook, The Thief, The Wife and Her Lover, Whiplash, The Warriors, The French Connection, obviously in New York, uh, Zodiac, On the Waterfront. And um, by the way, if you look at that uh, Twitter account, uh, it is not the name, even though it's at the working man, the name is Docker because I'm claiming to be a well, I am basically a, a, working on the docs now in my Twitter profile. Um, any two conspiracy carry on at your convenience. Uh, Harry Brown. Big Trouble in Little China, Dogville, Kill List, Princess Bride, 12 Angry Men, Ip Man, Love, Honor, and Bay, The King of Kong, Magnolia, and number 70 was The Raid. And I'll just stop here very quickly to talk about The Raid. Um, basically, all the stuff I said about John Wick is, is true of The Raid. Perfect action film. The storyline is done and dusted in the first two minutes. And uh, what I love about The Raid is that it's like a, it's like a kind of... Um, computer game where he's moving through this building and he's trying to get to the top to face the end boss. Oh, the, uh, the fighting, the martial arts in the film is incredible. The sense of tempo, uh, everybody needs to watch the raid at least once. I thought it was fantastic. And, um, 
I actually believe that if the raid had not been a kind of sleeper hit in 2011, John Wick probably would not have been made. I think the raid is a very big influence on John Wick. Um, anyway, 69, man with a movie camera, train spotting, about Schmidt, revenge of the Sith, uh, performance, Zulu, full metal jacket, salesman, freaks, Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence, this is England, taxi driver, scum, downfall, the wolf of Wall Street, kind hearts and coronets, the birthday party, Alice in Wonderland, the Wicker Man, Groundhog Day, King of Comedy, John Wick, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, Space Odyssey, Metropolis, Blue Remembered Hills, Goodfellas, A Razor Head, and Pinocchio. And we are caught up. Are you ready for the top 40, ladies and gentlemen? Get ready. Okay. So um, let's go. Oh, also, uh, as per yesterday, I will stop at every 10 to read out any super chats that happen to have come in. I don't think there's been any so far, um, but, uh, you know, uh, maybe there will be soon. I don't think I've missed any. Okay. So, um, oh, and a lot of people are, and so the two films people were most unhappy about were Razorhead, um, uh, which is very artsy, I, I'll grant you, and lots of people don't like it, and The Cook, The Thief, The Wife, and Her Lover, uh, several people said, oh, that's a really arty, kind of pretentious film. Uh, well, you know, what, what can you do? Um, so, you know, <laughs> sometimes an arts PhD is going to arts PhD, you know. Um, but uh, and what else? Uh, oh, yes. And um, one person said they're from South London and they really dislike Love, Honor and Obey. They think it's a ridiculous film, which is fair enough. All, all opinions are subjective. Only some are more correct than others. Okay, so let's get on with it. Number 40 is Sallow or 120 Days of Sodom. Uh, <laughs> now, where to start with this? Um, this is probably the most disgusting film you'll ever see. It is really revolting. Um, and why is it on the list? I've only ever, I've only ever seen this film once. I've only ever seen it, uh, um, and I, I, I actually had to watch it in several stages because the person I was with walked out of the room. Um, they went; they were sick. Um, they that we then had to pause it to have an argument about why I was bringing this filth into the. <laughs> this was my, uh, I guess, Mrs. A one. We could call her the. Uh, but anyway, we had a row because I was like, "Why are you making me watch this rubbish?" Um, so, uh, you know, but anyway, I, I still ended up watching it all. Um, but um, the thing is, um, um, the uh, the thing is about Salo is that um, when I watched it, I felt tainted. It stayed with me. It haunted me. It, it, it almost polluted my, polluted my brain. Um, and for weeks on end afterwards, I was thinking, what is this film about? I was working at the time uh, in the city and I was producing a, I was producing an event um, that was in Chicago and all of my other colleagues, they were, they were up on this very trendy bar, um, you know, drinking cocktails, looking at, looking over that big egg thing. And, uh, you know, we were all in suits and it was all cool and stuff. Um, and I thought, listen, I, I can't stop thinking about Salo. So I went to the New York Public Library. I went to the Chicago Public Library while everybody else was having drinks to get all the books I could about Pasolini and about this film to see what on earth critics say about it. Why is it so rated? What is it trying to say? Um, if people uh, don't know the setup, there are these four libertines. It's kind of set in um, this uh, kind of fascist. It was like a kind of rump state left over from Mussolini's uh, Italy called Salo and these um these four libertines kidnap all of these young people uh force them to strip down as you can see and um the um they then uh basically uh, commit all sorts of debauch um you know including uh you know every every sort of rape you can imagine uh gratuitous acts of violence shit eating you name it it's there uh and the structure of the structure of it follows uh, Dante's nine nine circles of hell. 
So that so they keep on kind of descending down and down as the film goes on. And even though you're watching all of this uh, kind of gratuitous act, the film is actually really quite dull. It's really slow and boring. And you're kind of, it's, um, you know, it's disgusting, but at the same time, you're like nauseous with boredom watching this thing. Uh, it's a very strange experience to watch. And um, the reason, uh, it, anyway, after all this reading around, um, I actually came to believe that Pasolini was trying to make um, a comment on, uh, I, rather than making a comment on fascism, making a comment on bourgeois sensibilities and um, the idea of trying to make everything an aesthetic experience, trying to make everything, um, trying to make everything, uh, I don't know, pleasurable, um, but then becoming really kind of, uh, I guess you could say anal about your pleasure or anal about the aesthetic experience. And then this will to, shall we say, rank everything, uh, to codify, to, um, and um, I think this is what the film is, is getting at. It's getting at the, it's getting at this will to try to impose order on that, which is aesthetic, um, which uh, obviously as somebody making a top 100 list is, Kind of uh, kind of an interesting uh, interesting thought. Um, so uh, yes, if the one of the interesting things about uh, uh, Salo is that um, the the libertines, even though they're having all of these experiences, they're trying to push it to the limit, they're trying to get to the next hit. Um, they're they're up against you know the law of diminishing marginal returns. You know the more extreme they get, the less they're getting out of this. You know, they're trying to like they're trying to savor the differences between all these different varieties of of extremity. And yet they and yet they're not really feeling anything. The, the joy of it is almost sucked out of it because they've because they're, they're they're trying to impose so much order on everything. So that's uh, that's what I think Salo is about. It's almost a comment on, I guess you'd say, consumerist society that this is what. Um, you know, when you when you think of the YouTube videos of the kid with the opening the Star Wars box or of the, um, you know, the memes some people make, you know, don't ask questions, just consume, um, you know, the, the, these are kind of overgrown children who are just uh, who, who are just kind of talking about what are they being served? What are, what is the product that they're that they're consuming? You know, it's more and more. I mean, it's it literally in some cases shit. So th I think this is what Salo is trying to get at. Um, but I won't linger anymore. Um, I think every serious film fan should watch it once. Lots of people will disagree and just say it's pretentious rubbish. Other people will just say it's uh, trying to be shocking for its own sake. But um, I'm in the camp that thinks it's uh, it's important. Not that I dig it out very often, it has to be said. It's one of those ones where you watch it once and I think that's it forever. But once was enough. Number 39, another disturbing film, I guess you could say, is Old Boy. Um, now, one of the types of films I like, I like films that are, as I mentioned, a duel of wits, a duel between two different wills. And um, Old Boy, uh, not only is it a classic revenge film, but it is um, it is also how far are these two men going to push each other and who's who is who's going to break first. Um, now this guy here, I think his name's Evergreen. I think his name's Evergreen in the in the in the in the cast list. Um, he is a contender for one of the worst villains in any. I mean, he is a, a horrible, horrible person, right up there with Chad from uh, in the Company of Men, and and uh, probably the Libertines from Salo. You know, they'd be on the villains list too. Um, but this guy is. I mean. I don't think it gives too much away, but it, it starts with um, uh, the, the, you know, the, the other guy, the old boy. Um, he's had him abducted and kept in solitary for 15 years. Um, and he almost like he kind of keeps him in bad conditions and things. And uh, essentially the film is a, is a revenge mission after, after he gets out. Um, it's tremendous. I mean, again, re really, uh, really quite sick, but um it's got a vis visceral pace and an energy uh it's quite an exhilarating film i think old boy and um really some uh really some very uh 
haunting scenes that will stay for you. And old boy, unlike Solo, is not so disturbing that you wouldn't watch it more than once. So uh, I very highly rate old boy. Fantastic film. Um, so uh, let's keep on uh, going uh, because number 38 is The Lord of the Rings. Now I've cheated a little bit uh, by making them all one film because I am of the opinion that the way to watch Lord of the Rings is to get the special extended box set with all of the extra stuff put back in and to watch it all in a in a one like 13 hour sitting which uh, every once in a while I'll try to do every once in a while I'll try to do the um the the marathon the Lord of the Rings marathon um and you could do it in a day if you if you pace yourself and you can plan meals around it and things and uh, I th it's a really quite I mean, you, you you see how good the films are if you watch them all in one day. Now, I actually happened to do the same thing with The Hobbit um, because the cinema near me, when the third Hobbit came out, they did an all night thing where you'd watch the first two. And then as the premiere hit at midnight, you'd watch the new one. Um, Hobbit, unfortunately, uh, works nowhere near as well and uh, is, is, is far inferior as, as a trilogy of films. But Lord of the Rings, I think, is probably as good as it gets uh, for a book, book adaptation, bringing a bringing a well loved story uh, to life. Um, now, purists will say, "Oh, well, yeah, you know, but you'll never get to the the Tolkien." But I, I actually disagree. I think I think every single cut uh, made to Lord of the Rings was correct. You know, you read the you read the books. There's all this poetry, Tom Bombadil, and all this. Okay, get lost. Come on. Get, get to the so i think um lord of the rings does a superb job of um what it is um i also think that the the core stories you know the story of uh sam and frodo there the story of Gollum, the uh the you know aragon's quest the uh legolas and gimli uh, gandalf story of course um what's going on with saruman all every single part of it works as a kind of narrative is in its own right truly epic um epic cinema um one of my all-time highlights as a film fan was uh going to watch the two towers when it came out in 2002 and seeing that battle at the end or what is it the uh, what's the battle called um at the end of uh at the end of um uh two towers is it the battle of uh Oh, Helm's Deep, Helm's Deep, that's the one. And um, I, I mean, coming out of the cinema, I was just in a day. I was in days for like a day, for like a day later. That was the best battle scene I'd ever seen in anything. It was so epic. It was so incredible. Um, Return of the King, I mean, when it came out, everybody felt it went on a bit too long. You know, it feels like it ends about 15 times. But if you do the special extended 13 hour all in one all in one day thing you will understand why it ends so many times because it kind of needs to to pay off all of the different things that you've just witnessed so it really is i i think it's a tremendous uh work you know they film them back to back um in many ways the legacy of lord of the rings hasn't been very good for cinema you know they made all of these knockoff uh epic films after then uh, they, you know, gave studios the idea of like coming out with a franchise. We're going to make a franchise and we're going to do everything back to back. And um, so uh, all of those things, yes, they've been harmful. But Lord of the Rings itself, I think, is tremendous. Also, politically speaking, I think it's fundamentally a conservative text. Um, you know, the, uh, you know, the Shire, the the love of the home, the uh, the fact they're trying to get back, the um, yeah, I, I, you know, it's a, it's a, it has built in, uh, you know, there's a fear of the outsider there. I guess you want to put it that way. Um, you know, a, a kind of suspicion of modernity. Uh, uh, so all of those things are there, you know, in the original Tolkien and um, probably Peter Jackson's just like, even though I know the writers were kind of leftists and so on, they just weren't, in, you know, at that point, they weren't really thinking along those lines. Um, and uh, so there it is. So, yeah, Saffron saying a return to tradition. Yeah, I don't see any reason why Lord of the Rings shouldn't be a, 
held up as a great kind of traditional. It, I mean, Tolkien is getting back to pre-modern values. Um, and by pre-modern, I mean like before Shakespeare, before um, before the kind of uh, texts that started to ask questions of the medieval world order. He's harking back to you know, I not just the kind of ancient Greek epics, but he, like uh, you know stuff like Beowulf and um, the the heroism of those you know with, where we're t where we're thinking in terms of archetypes as opposed to the individual and things like that. So. Um, yeah, Lord of the Rings. I I still rate it very highly. I'm sure everybody else has got um, has got many many uh, views on this. But uh, let's keep on going. Um, uh, yes. Um, so number thirty seven. Another tremendous film. I'm all right, Jack. Um, classic uh, Bolting Brothers comedy uh, from uh, the late fifties. This was at a time when the unions were causing a lot of trouble in Britain. And the ultimate anti-union film is I'm All Right, Jack, featuring uh, probably one of the his career best performances from Peter Sellers as the kind of pseudo intellectual. Uh, you know, he captures the union, the union guy so well in the film where, you know, he's a uh, kind of lower middle class. He's read a little bit of Marx. He fancies himself as a bit of an intellectual. Um yeah, really, really good film. Um, also an interesting look at how self-interested uh, and selfish human beings are. It doesn't just have a go at the unions. It has a go at everybody. Um, and this is a, so it's kind of an interestingly anti-establishment film as well, because the whole idea is, is that um, the unions and the, and the company bosses are kind of in cahoots. They kind of engineer a general strike situation um because they they each have these uh, vested interests so yeah i'm all right jack absolutely top notch movie if you haven't seen it uh you should do so at once um so good on the union stuff uh yep one of my favorites i'll keep on going well, now we'll really get into the business end now these are films that i just love all the way all the way around and um so if you remember uh, last time I said Love, Honor and Bay was my pick of my favorite uh, kind of British gangster films of that crop um, that came out around the time of the Guy Ritchie movies. Now, I was not including in that Sexy Beast because it's a different a different type of film, really. Um, but Sexy Beast, uh, Ray Winstone is, sec is, is in Sexy Beast, but the film is all about the central performance of Ben Kingsley, who is absolutely phenomenal as this uh, chap here, Don Logan. Um, I mean, I've talked about bullies quite a lot. He's probably the ultimate bully in a film. Um, his rants are insane. Uh, there's something hypnotic about the way he he goes on. Um, you know, uh, do you know what I mean? Idi Amin and all this sort of stuff. Amazing film, uh, Sexy Beast. Um, I love the way it starts with... Uh, Ray Winston on the beach and, uh, you know, sitting on the beaches, looking at the peaches. Sexy Beast is fantastic. Um, did he win an Oscar for it? I want to say Ben Kingsley may have won an Oscar for this role. Certainly he should have been nominated. I mean, if he didn't, he should have won it. Um, one of the things I realized looking through the list is that you, you get certain years, which um, seem to have a lot of good films. The year 2000, a lot of good films. Um, you know, Sexy Beast, Love, Honor, and Obey. I seem to remember um, Gladiator came out in the year 2000. Um, lots of decent movies came out in that year. So there we uh, go. Um, so let's uh, let's uh, keep on going. Somebody said this film annoyed me. I wanted to punch Gandhi. Well, that's the idea. I mean, he's, he's basically kind of, he is um, relentless. He is... Um, uh, irritating he's waspish he's uh you know he's almost like a force of evil he's almost like the devil incarnate in this film um and his breaking down of the ray winston character because he wants him he basically wants the ray winston character to come out of retirement and he won't do it and he's like you will you will he's trying to he's trying to break him down um and there are moments where he just starts like shouting you know at one point he shouts um what is it yes roundry yes you will friday be there Yes, yes, yes. 
Um, and then there's, an, there's another there's another rant that he goes on where he starts shouting no, no, no a lot as well. So I just basically love the film for that reason. Uh, so let's keep on going. Um, so number 35, another Stone Cold uh, classic, um, The Seventh Seal from 1957. I really like uh, Ingmar Bergman, uh, kind of dour Swedish director. A lot of these kind of, uh, um, you know, uh brooding swedish films but one of the one of the best of them is uh is the seventh seal in which um uh death as you can see in there the grim reaper comes for this knight and the knight tries to bargain for his life and they they say let's have a game of chess and if i can beat death at chess uh D death says well you can live basically but uh, of course you cannot cheat death brilliant film it's set uh in the, in the in the kind of medieval era during the during the uh, the plague you know during the black death um and uh yeah many uh many interesting uh scenes a meditation on faith uh people who are religious i think would would uh would have a lot of interesting things to say about the seventh seal um you know serious film but also just cool it's just cool you know it's death playing chess i mean what what um what can you um what can you say? So let's uh, let's keep on going. Um, number thirty four, uh, kind of a kind of a student. Uh, back in my student days, everybody loved this film, but I think a lot of students love With Nail and I, um, because uh, I mean there used to be a game where you, you know try to keep up with uh, Richard E. Grant's drinking in With Nail and I. Um, it's um. You know, there are these two guys, uh, they go and um, stay in a cottage in the countryside and they, they've got a kind of fat gay uncle, I seem to remember. Um, screenplay is amazing. Um, the performance from Richard Lee Grant is fantastic. Earlier on, I posted, uh, I posted as a reply to Mark um, uh, a speech of, uh, from Hamlet. You know, uh, oh, what a piece of work is a man, how infinite in reason, how infinite in faculty. Well, that is the speech that uh, he keeps on uh, reciting in uh, With Nail and I, because he's an, he's an out of work actor. Um, I love many aspects of the film. I like how grotty their their place is. You know, they, they haven't done the washing up. He's, a, he's He kind of like neglects himself. Um, he, he is a, he's a, he, he's a, he's a bitter character um there are some just amazing moments there's one moment where he just looks up and he says i demand some booze that was uh that was always a favorite when we were when we were students so everybody should watch uh with nail and i especially if you're currently in university i would say uh, uh absolutely um essential viewing you know in your in your student days but even uh even subsequently it's just a very very good film um and a great uh i guess you'd call it a black a black comedy black comedy yeah <laughs> so um yes yeah, mitch is saying is he a bully yes he is a bully is it dark now you see you're trying to you're trying to leer with me you're trying to bait me i'm not going to say it <laughs> um so uh let's uh let's carry on uh let's carry on going um yeah so i i i really I really do. Uh, somebody said it's like bottom with posh accents. Yes, it is. It is. It is. It's like, I mean, oh, but also I love the, um, I love the kind of de decrepitude of everything, not just in their place, but when they, when they go down to, is it uncle Monty? Is that his name? When they go down to that cottage and it's all kind of, all a bit kind of disheveled and disused. And, um, I love the idea of, uh, der 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 dereliction. Um, I like seeing, uh, derelict buildings and things like i call it derelict in uh in honor of zoolander and um there's a lot of that in this film as well and it kind of i guess you'd call it pathetic fallacy it it reflects the uh what you know what is in richard e grant character's heart is being reflected in his external surroundings so i guess you'd call that the pathetic fallacy um so let's uh let's keep on uh going because uh number 33 of course, I love the smell of napalm in the morning. Is Apocalypse Now? Um, 
uh, by Francis Ford Coppola. Fantastic uh, film. Now, I'm actually not sure about um, what the normal version of Apocalypse Now is because there was a there was a release called Apocalypse Now Redux um, where they brought it out again and they put a lot of deleted scenes back in. It was like a special extended one. And I saw it for the very first time in the cinema um, when that was released. And uh, that is the version that I know. So I don't know if uh, I, I want to say there are long extended sequences of French people talking about politics in that version. If that isn't in the normal one, then maybe 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 that's what they cut out. But I actually love those scenes with the French. You know, it's so um, there's a th th it's probably one of the best bits of comments on the French mindset is just that little politics discussion they have in the middle of it. Um, the other thing I love about Apocalypse Now is that you forget um, you forget who's in it. You forget the House of Ford crops up at the start, for example. Um, and there are all these different bits. You know, Marlon Brando's in it and Dennis Hopper's in it and uh, Robert Duvall is in it. And it's all like different bits and it's kind of epic. Um, I really like Apocalypse Now. Of course, it's based on the um, uh, Joseph Conrad novel, Heart of Darkness, although it's uh, they, they relocated it to Vietnam. Um, and uh, it asks all sorts of interesting questions about war, about colonialism, about, uh, about all sorts of different things. And um, it's just cool. I think it's a just, cool, just a cool film. So, uh, yeah, Apocalypse Now. Um, some people are saying that, uh, that it's a bit boring, but um, uh, I, I don't know. I, I kind of like, I kind of like, I don't think it's boring. I think it's really good. So let's keep on going. Uh, we're on a quite a decent uh, um, kick now uh, because number 32 uh, is Woody Allen's uh, finest uh, moment, Annie Hall. Now, every once in a while, you get uh, actor, you know, actors who are born to play parts. I think Diana Keaton was pretty much born to play Annie Hall. Um, really a very good romantic uh, comedy, I guess, um, with all sorts of uh, interesting little kind of clever touches from Woody Allen. You know, there's famously a scene where he's uh, queuing up to the cinema and there's this critic talking about the, uh, talking about the, the, the you know, the thing they're going to see. And the actual, like, uh, the, the writer is there and he goes and corrects the, goes and corrects the cricket, uh, the, 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 the critic. And um, uh, Woody Allen talks directly to the camera. Uh, there are all sorts of cool things. Now, is, um, is uh, somebody may need to? Is this the film that Woody Allen is uh, uh, that Christopher Walken is in? Is like her brother, or is that Manhattan? Um, I want. I, I always get confused between Christopher Walken crops up in one of these films as well. I want to say it's this one. Um, I just really like. It's a kind of really all of Woody Allen's films, kind of love New York and the uh, the kind of uh, feeling of being in a city and. Uh, Yes, it's 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 a, it's, a, it's a very good film. Yeah, it, Walken. Uh, yeah, I thought this is the one with uh, Christopher Walken in it. Uh, all of the bits with him in it are amazing. You forget how funny Christopher Walken can be uh, a lot of the time. Um, the uh, uh, yeah. So Annie Hall, fantastic movie. Whatever you make of Woody Allen, I don't think you could take away the fact this is probably one of the best, if not the best, romantic comedy ever made. Um, I love it, uh, you know, special place in my heart. And uh, we're getting up now to the point where all of these films are going to be special in some way uh, to me uh, because this is a very personal film, this. Um, so there we go. So let's keep on going. Number 31 is um, Time Bandit. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons it's Time Bandit is, is for the performance of this man here, David Warner. Um, some people, some video game fans will know him from, uh, from, um, Baldur's Gate 2, where he plays John Irenicus. Got one of the coolest voices of any person ever. Uh, you know, I, you know, I love him as Irenicus. I also love him here. I think his character is just called Evil Genius. <laughs> um, uh, he's also in, um, in the animated Batman. He plays, uh, Rachel Ghoul in that. But anyway, uh, David Warner always worth seeing in anything he's in especially when he's a bad guy um uh, but aside from warner time bandits is really underrated 
Now, people talk about Der- uh, Terry Gilliam. They always talk about Brazil. Um, I think Time Bandits really is uh, overlooked in his uh, in his pantheon. I haven't I haven't ranked Brazil. He's got another film as well. They kind of form a trilogy. Um, it's called The Adventures of Baron Munchausen. Um, I was thinking about including that as well. It didn't quite make the cut, but that's very well worth seeking out too. It's a little bit disjointed, but uh, I, I kind of enjoy Baron Munchausen. Um, you know, there, there were some scenes which were creepy to watch as a kid with uh, the Angel of Death in them, for example. Uh, and Jonathan Price is in that as, as he is in Brazil. Um, but anyway, Time Bandits, well worth uh, watching. It's got this young boy in it. His, um, it, you know, there's some weird comments on consumerism and how, um, uh, I guess, um, brainless television is rotting uh, people's brain, you know, people's minds. Um, his parents are so detached and so weird. You know, they're just watching this awful stuff on television. Um, and then, uh, then this young boy who's yearning for just some life, some something, some escape, some adventure. Um, he goes on this amazing journey with these little dwarves and meet Sean Connery and John Cleese and all these people along the way. It's a fun film, great adventure film, um, great uh, kind of fantasy movie, but at the same time, it explores a lot of those interesting uh, themes of like, what is the heart of your culture giving you? And um, clearly it's not doing it for this young lad. Also, God makes an appearance in it um, as this kind of floating head um, because he wants his map back. And um, there are lots of interesting things between evil genius and God because evil genius, he's kind of, it's like a bit paradise lost, like, I guess it's like Satan asking questions of God. Um, It's it's interesting. Uh, I also love the set designs in it. You know, everything's wrapped in plastic and um yeah, so I, I like uh I like uh Time Bandits and I it's probably my favorite uh Terry uh Gilliam uh movie. Um also uh John Cleese as Robin Hood is very funny. Um he plays Robin Hood as a kind of like royal, like meeting <laughs> it's almost like a member of the royal family. Um uh Sean Connery is cool in the film. Uh, as a kind of, I think they go to like mythical ancient Greece or something. Um, you fight the Cyclops, I seem to remember. All sorts of things happen in it. Uh, really good. So let's, uh, ca- uh, maybe I'll go to Super Chats now. And uh, when I come back, we'll do more. Just going to have a little puff on this cigar. <clears throat> yeah <laughs> robin hood <laughs> and you're a robber too how long have you been a robber wally about four foot two <laughs> um okay so let's uh let's have a look at super chats uh, now how do i get to super chats on the new on the stupid new why do they keep on changing the layout of youtube Okay, now, now, right now, I've got it. I've sat to. I, I, every time I go on YouTube, I switch it back to classic, uh, um, classics, uh, classic mode. All right, so here we are. Um, okay. So, uh, I think Harian Gladiv says this counts as my one stream ban question mark. Oh no, Harian. Um, and you're, you've got a one stream unpopular opinions ban. When I hand out bans, it's for unpopular opinions and you, sir, have got one stream ban. Although I can't remember what for, what was that for? It's probably, he was being cheeky, being very cheeky. Um, uh, George the Great and Powerful says, "Big fan, a big fan of uh, Sal- Salat. The raid is a great showcase for the martial arts. Yes, I mean it is tremendous. The, the raid is just, um, I mean, I don't know what the best martial arts in a film is, um, but 
I would say it's surely between the raid, Ip Man, and John Wick in terms of impressive fights. It's got to be between those three, hasn't it? Or at least those three. I mean, I know there's a raid two, the sequels to Ip Man, and the sequels to John Wick as well. But I would say it's between those three series. Um, you know, yeah, I've seen some of the old martial arts uh, films and the Bruce Lees and all that, but they're not they're not as um, they're not as hardcore as 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 the fighting in those three films i would say so uh that would be my those would be i think it's between those three those three i mean it, it the the ip man is insane uh in terms of what he can do but the guy in the raid is pretty amazing i mean the fighting in the raid is next i mean they're all slightly different styles aren't they um but then again one of the things I've, i don't know about john wick does keanu reeves do his own do his own training because if he does Keanu Reeves must be like in the one of the world's best martial artists at this point I mean how does he manage to do it I don't I mean I don't know about that um uh so so there we go I mean somebody's saying that uh Bruce Lee was a real martial artist but um the um okay but surely the guy in uh, the raid is a real martial artist too and surely the guy in it man is a real one. I mean, surely those guys are actual martial art artists. You can't, you can't do that stuff without it. Um, Keanu Reeves. I mean, Keanu Reeves in, uh, John wick is a bit more of a kind of, uh, brawler. He's not like much of a finesse fighter. He's, you know, he's very rugged, I guess. So he doesn't do anything that this is that kind of difficult, I guess, but the other two guys must be, they must be martial artists. I mean, um, so anyway, that's uh, lots of people are saying it's called acting, it's called choreography. I mean, yeah, but you know, I couldn't do that. I mean, I may, maybe with enough training, if you gave me like ten years or something, I, I doubt it though. Um, Got to have a lot. Got to have a lot of. Um, yeah, apparently, apparently, Keanu Reeves did almost all his martial arts for The Matrix and John Wick. My God. Um, and yes, the real Lip Man did train uh, the young Bruce Lee. That's what he's famous for uh charlemagne says i hope empire of dust made the list no empire of dust did not make the list but it is a really good film um and an eye opener as well of uh classic it's also tiresome um so let's uh let's keep on going i'm very impressed that keanu reeves does all his own does all his own stuff in there because some of that stuff is really quite really quite something i would say um architect of fate says prediction number one is Highlander there can there can be only one um well I mean I, I I can exclusively reveal Highlander did not make the list uh, I'm afraid sorry about that um pseudonym says even Sallow doesn't approve of a pig in a thong <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean the libertines never never at any point bring any pigs into the into the action so the Britisher is probably more libertine than the four libertines in solo. Damascus Steel says on solo, every time a film or opera adds the bourgeois or political critique on things, I tend to find it loses a lot of edge. Same is true with more modern renditions um, of things like the opera Salome. Uh, okay. Oh, so you think uh, you think that solo loses its edge because it's because of a uh, I mean, I, I don't, I don't know. I could be. Yeah, so let me let me know if you think Salo has lost its edge for that reason. Silly Sailor says there's far too much fawning over these Hollywood types in the in this award show. Didn't you learn anything from Ricky Gervais's Golden Globes? Happy New Year! <laughs> oh yeah, I mean the Ricky Gervais speech was absolutely amazing at the Golden Globes. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, Samson Agonisti says I'm related to the stream because I rarely catch you live. But was the book uh, about all the experts shilling for the UK to join the Euro? What was the book? Oh, that book was by Peter Oborn, and it was called. Uh, uh, the the name is Pete. If you just type into Google Peter Oborn, uh, Euro book or Peter, you um, that you'll find it. That's the uh, that's the one uh samson uh jaws the great and powerful says google donny yen hong kong nightclub okay people can go and do that 
Charlemagne says Keanu does the training. Watch the special features. Great. And agree. The avaricious says if Dark Crystal is not on the list, I, I'm going to make Skeksis Chamberlain noises. <laughs> Skeksis Chamberlain noises. Um, Labyrinth better be number one, knowing it's you doing this list. Um, hmm. Hmm. Um, it, I'm afraid the Dark Crystal is not on the list. Um, and one of the reasons is because I rewatched it recently uh, before the, the Netflix series starts. And I still haven't, I've only been 20 minutes. And I started to watch the Netflix series twice. And I only got 20 minutes in each time. Once because I was with my parents and my um, they were just my parents were talking, my mother wouldn't settle down and things. And the other time is because um, I was with Mrs. AA and she was moaning. And she was like, oh, I was like, look, I have to do this another time. And I've I haven't managed to come back uh, to the Dark Crystal um, uh, Netflix series. But my criticism of the Dark Crystal, even even though the Skeksis are amazing and Chamberlain is amazing and all the rest of it. It's, it is quite slow, dull film, and it's and it's quite. Um, I always think the Dark Crystal is quite straight laced, and it's it's it's, it's like high fantasy played dead straight. Um, you don't see that very often, and it's commendable for it, but uh, a little bit too a little bit too dry, I think, for a top hundred list. Uh, you know, for my personal top hundred list. Not saying that you shouldn't put it on yours. Okay, so with all that said. Why don't we uh, carry on? And I do, I do, don't get me wrong. I do like and rate the Dark Crystal, just not quite on the top 100. All right, so let's keep on going. Number 30 is American Beauty. Now I can see some people rolling their eyes already. How can you put something like this on the list? But um, I think uh, American Beauty is a fantastic film. Um, one of the things that's really good for I mean, it's good in many many different ways so even though sam mendes was the director um the real star of the direction was uh the director of photography um for the movie the name escapes me now but the um the the director of photography um it, but anyway the 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 camera work is amazing in american beauty it's um it's uh it's it's uh, I mean, some people are saying unsubscribe i i don't i don't know i i, I don't know I, I think american beauty asks a lot of interesting questions about the modern world and um some people say um some people say that uh uh black build is not going to be uh happy i i'm not sure about that i'm i i think there are aspects of the of the film that you could appreciate from the uh from a reactionary angle um uh, hear me out here. So yes, uh, the film is essentially about uh, Kevin Spacey's character here, uh, Lester Burnham, going through uh, a midlife crisis and basically kind of living out his boomer, his kind of boomer midlife crisis. Okay, um, and he's got this very highly strung wife who goes and kind of cuckolds him with this uh, with the king. You know, this is what it feels to be nailed by the king. You know, who's this uh, kind of sleazy. Uh, sleazy sales guy uh, with amazing um, silver fox hair and dark eyebrows which is always a look i like um but um the the acting in the film is fantastic the script is really good the secondary performances in the film are really good you know the um the uh you know there's the couple living across the road and the uh the old the older guy is like the army sergeant who's uh and I know, I know Black Pill didn't like the film because um, there are these kind of homoerotic undertones, and uh, you know because the guy is uh, you know right wing, he's he's uh, you know secretly secretly gay under it and all the rest of it. I I, I don't I don't think any of that stuff is is important. Um, the um, his wife, uh, so his performance, Chris Cooper's performance is really good, but the wife who has basically a silent role in the film is really good i mean that's one of the best like mute performances in a film i can remember um and then you have the uh then you have the young boy and the and and the and and the kids um a lot of the a lot of uh american beauty is trying to get at this idea that um there must be something more you know so yes okay all those things black pill said but 
think about what those guys always talk about. There must be something more to life than the material. I mean, that's what American beauty is about. It's trying to get at you know some meaning in life that is more than that's why that's why they keep on following that like plastic bag around they're trying to find something more something some immaterial beauty something uh beyond all of these things that aren't making these people happy you know this couple have everything you know they're trying to get down where you know they're trying to reignite some passion in their relationship and Oh, she's worried about he's going to spill wine on the on the sofa or whatever. So, I I actually think that American Beauty is um, uh, unfairly written off because of the black pilled uh, review of it. I I still think it's a good film. I think it's worth watching, and I think it's technically excellent in every department. Acting is probably the best Kevin Spacey performance ever. Annette Bening is really good in it. All of the secondary performances are excellent. The script is good. The uh, cinematography is amazing. Um, you know, Sam Mendes was there. You know, so all, all of those things. Uh, so, so people are saying I'm a wet. I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. So let's let's keep on going. Everybody says it's a. Well, I don't know why this is such, such an unpopular pick, but I, I'm going to stick with it. So, um, <laughs> uh, number twenty nine is um, is uh, Michael Haneke's uh, Funny Games. Um, so if you remember, uh, I, one of my picks was uh, The Birthday Party, the William Friedkin film. Uh, Funny Games has got the same idea, basically. These two strangers come and they want to terrorize this family. And, um, yeah, it's fun to watch the uh, – I mean, it's not fun. It's a, it's it's pretty sinister, really. Um, they come and they basically torture and uh, make life hell for this uh, couple. Um, and uh, – one of the interesting things about funny games is um, that Hanukkah pulls away. He doesn't show you the violence. Whenever there's anything gratuitous going on, the camera pans away. You can hear what's happening, but you're watching like the wall or something. So a lot of what happens in the film plays out in your own imagination. And there's probably some um, a comment about, you know, the nature of violence or something going on. He was probably like I, I think Hanukkah. I imagine Hanukkah is quite a leftist uh, filmmaker, so he was probably trying to say something about how we consume violence, especially and in that moment in the '90s where the Tarantino was uh, making his splash and all the rest of it. But uh, I think Funny Games is a very interesting, interesting film. Um, uh, yeah, so I'll just leave it there. So uh, let's keep on um, going. Uh, number twenty-eight is Deliverance um, from 1972. Uh, John Moore Borman, uh, very uh, interesting look at uh, certain parts of the Deep South. Um, now, I know a lot of people, people from down south in America, but I can imagine some people would say, oh, well, this is clearly demonizing the south. It's demonizing, um, demonizing the southern man. In, in, in a way that uh, probably like Django and Chain does in a way as well, like if, you, if the way that that's depicted. But um, I don't care about all that. What I care about is the – you get these remote areas um, in some of these films and the sorts of grotesque, strange people you meet in these uh, remote uh, towns. This is a fascinating thing to see on screen. And Deliverance is one of the ultimate films uh, for it. It's got some very famous, I can see some people saying, uh, um, squeal like a pig, re, yeah, indeed. Um, um, dueling banjos. Yeah, every, I mean, some people are saying everything you like is anti-white. Well, I mean, the thing is, is that, uh, yeah, okay, maybe these, some of these things are there, but... Um, this is still a good film, like regardless of uh, regardless of some of those other things. Deliverance uh, is just a really good film. It's got a lot of a uh, lot of memorable moments, and it's um, and it stays with you, uh, and it's fun as well. I think it's fun. I think it's a lot. It's kind of crazy film, um, and uh, it, it, it's one of those things that if you caught it on TV, it'd, it'd start, and then as it went on, it would start surprising you with how just where just how extreme and kind of um like what ends up happening in it okay so 
let's uh, keep on going then. Uh, uh, Philo Mattis says, I literally live where Deliverance was filmed. Now, now, <laughs> uh, did, um, do you think that the filmmakers were unfair on the residents of that town? <laughs> Do you think it was anti? Do you think it was anti kind of Southern man? This film, like anti Southern propaganda by Yankee Doodles. Let's have a look. No, no, he doesn't. So there we go. There you go. <laughs> so let's uh, let's keep on going, um, because number twenty seven. Speaking of remote areas with really interesting locations and so on, no country for old men. Um, and you know, I was saying about how 2000 was a great year for films. 2007 was an absolutely barnstorming year. I mean, so many great films came out in 2007. And I remember Old No Country for Old Men was one of them. Um, really good film. Um, you know, Avier Bardem was great as the kind of sinister, slightly autist. Uh, villain um in the you know he, one of the interesting things about him is that he's remember i was saying about like some people are just evil they just do bad things because they like to do bad things now i i like that in films because it it cuts against liberal narratives it cuts against the leftist vision of the world and there it is right in the heart of no country for old men this guy is not reformable He's not. You can stick this guy in prison, and it's not going to matter, because he is he is doing these things for his own reasons, and he and he's not going to apologize for it. Um, and up against that, the only the only justice you can have is rough justice. It has to be hard, you know, not restorative or uh, rehabilitative justice, but uh, you know, retribution. Hard justice is required. You know, you need to meet. You he's forced to meet a guy like this um another thing i like about the film is the uh sense of tiredness of the tommy lee jones character the world weariness the um the expansive open spaces uh i think it's put i mean for me the best coen brothers movie um i went i, I went through a stretch of watching every single coen i watched every single coen brothers movie in in order from blood simple onwards and um i actually think they're pretty overrated if i'm honest uh you know i i'm not a huge fan of some of their other works i like blood simple blood simple is really good and it almost it, it was kind of in the conversation when i was making the very long list and then i cut it down to 100 and i you know blood simple was on that longer list but it, en it ended up getting cut um but no country for old oh, men for me is their best film by a long way uh, really good. Uh, there are lots of other uh, interesting things that happen in it. Um, the shootouts and the chases and so on are tense. They get you into it. Um, it's kind of philosophically interesting. I don't know. I, I like I like the film a lot. Um, and uh, and and like I said, the Bardem character. I I think um, he's just not. Um, he you cannot absorb him into ready-made kind of hollywood leftist narratives and that's one of the reasons i i really like him as a villain so so there we go um somebody's uh saying yeah boston thing uh, um i mean i'm thinking of the other coen brothers movies um boston fink is good boston fink is, is is worth watching um i don't like big lebowski i don't like uh i think it's well overrated film uh, i don't like uh not that keen on um what was that one with george clooney in it you know everybody went on about it for a while uh oh, i can't even remember the name of it oh brother where art thou i mean that's got a great soundtrack but it's not like as a film i can take it or leave it to be honest um yeah the coens are weird they, they seem like they should be better than they are, but they, they you know, I, one of my, one of my, I tell you what, one of my issues with the Coen brothers, ever works, not this one. This is really good. Um, is that they, they seem like they lose focus and lots of their films feel like 
you're two thirds away through and they've lost interest in it and the films become unfocused and they drift and they kind of pitter out. That was my, that was my issue with a lot of the Coen brothers movies is that they were, they're indisciplined, they're indisciplined and they, um, and they lose focus. So that's, um, that's my comment there. Now, if you just uh, excuse me a second, my PC is not actually plugged in and I'm going to run out of battery. So give me one second. Uh, um, okay. Oh dear, I haven't got the plug. What am I going to do? Yeah. Oh, there it is. Okay. Okay. There it is. It had come out of the adapter. That was the issue. So, let, let me carry on then. All right, so No Country for Old Men. Great film. Now, interestingly... Um, one of the uh, when this won the best picture at the 2007 Oscars, back when the Oscars were worth watching because there were so many good films out, um, I remember being quite disappointed that it won because I didn't think it deserved to win that year, which is a spoiler for another film from 2007 um, that I think deserved to win that year instead. So let's keep on going because number 26 is um, uh, Doctor Strangelove. Directed by Stanley Kubrick, um, classic political uh, black comedy. Um, three tremendous performances from Peter Sellers, not only as Doctor Strangelove, but as the uh, British Army officer and the kind of LBJ president figure as well. Um, the you know so many amazing moments. The war room, uh, the the war room, the um, you know the uh, uh, general played by Sterling Hayden. You know, my vital essences, uh, the massive cigar he, uh, he, he smokes. Um, yeah, I really like Dr. Strangelove, um, you know, uh, Cowboy on the Bomb, all the rest of it. So, uh, yeah, I, I think um, uh, um, it's, how can I say? Um, what, one of the things I like about Kubrick films is how um th there seems to be a kind of intensity of focus um where the, the 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 camera just kind of stays stays on a situation it feels like it always feels like it lingers a little bit too long and i like that kind of slightly it's a slightly obsessive quality that um kubrick's lens has and uh, it's in all his films and that's something else i like about uh, uh dr strange love as well uh and it's funny I think it's a funny film. So let's uh, let's keep on going uh, because number twenty five is uh, Brian De Palma's Scarface, uh, an absolutely mental film. Um, now, fortunate I was fortunate because I got to see this in the cinema as well. Um, it was already a film I'd seen many times, but um, when I, they kind of gave, gave a limited re-release and they were they were showing it in some cinemas in London. And I got to see uh, Scarface on the big screen, so um, that was a that was a treat. Uh, I love Al Pacino, uh, especially when he's in over the top mode, and um, you know nothing exceeds like excess as uh, as um, you know, the world is yours. And um, Scarface is the ultimate um, '80s excess movie. You know the Thatcher Reagan era. Um, you know capitalism seemed like it was spiraling. I mean, I don't really care if De Palma had any like anti anti capitalist. Uh, I mean, maybe he did, maybe he didn't. I don't really care because the film is in, it's just so um, gloriously over the top. It's got loads of great lines uh, from the Oliver Stone uh, script. You know, uh, you know, America's one big f pussy waiting to be fucked is one of the famous lines. Um, the the whole thing when he's in the Pelican, the whole. Uh, the bad guys, you know, this is the last time you'll see a bad guy like this again. I love all the sleazy characters in it. Um, you know, the big boss, 
uh, you know, you know, come here, you little monkey, and all this sort of stuff. Um, yeah, it's just great. It's just great. Um, and the uh, central performance of uh, uh, Pacino, uh, tremendous, like iconic. Uh, nothing else you can say about it, really. Um, it's quite a long film, um, and there are obviously scenes of gratuitous violence and chainsaws and all the rest of it. But I think it, uh, I think it needs to be. It needs to be excessive, you know. Um, so uh, yeah, I I love uh, I love Scarface. Um, so let's um, let's keep on uh, going then, because number twenty four, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Now this um this is a d- difficult film, I think. Um, Jim Carrey in one of his uh, straight roles. Um, I think it's really good. If anybody's ever been in a long term relationship, and um, uh, you know is uh, split up and they want to get over it. Um, I wouldn't recommend watching Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind because it will probably it will probably gut you. Um, the whole setup of the film is that he's had this relationship with uh, the, the, the the Kate Winslet character there, and uh, he goes to um, he goes to this therapist who wants who, and basically they're going to remove his memories of this entire relationship to help him get over it, and then you watch all of these scenes which are taking place in his memory. And then as you're watching them, the memory wipe is coming. It's really, I mean, it's kind of, kind of high concept, but I really thought The Eternal Sunshine and the Spotless Mind was a very interesting film uh, with how it deals with memory, how it deals with narratives. You know, did this happen or didn't this happen? Uh, how it deals with who, you know, how much of memory is who we are and also how it deals with the relationship and how much of the relationship is the little narrative that you build together? And once you destroy that, what happens? You know, and having been, uh, you know, having been divorced um, once after a very long relationship, obviously this would, I don't know. Uh, um, uh, I haven't watched it since then. So, I mean, you know, maybe it'd be difficult to uh, watch after that, but even before then, I, I remember uh, really thinking this was a very interesting uh, film. So I will uh, I will carry on. Um, yeah, yeah, very good film uh, indeed. Uh, I, I just um, ironically, um, uh, every once in a while, um, you know, mainstream movies can surprise you. I guess. I mean, I, I'm guessing this was an indie film. Elijah Wood is in it randomly. He's, he's quite a kind of a horrible character in the film, uh, Elijah Wood. Um, but uh, yeah, anyway uh eternal sunshine um but not recommended if you're getting over a relationship i will say that it will probably like uh end you uh if you're already upset so i i would watch it i would actually watch it when you're in a happy relationship already rather than if you're trying to get over something because it's um it really is quite devastating um if you've ever loved anyone so number 23 is um um uh fanny and alexander um the ingmar bergman uh film uh now this is a very long film i think if you watched it all at once it's about five hours long um and it was turned into a tv series and maybe you could watch it almost as individual episodes of a tv um uh really interesting um heartwarming film in parts um you know uh existentially uh kind of an existential film uh all of in uh, bergman's films are about angst and they're about faith and they're about what life is about um anybody who's religious anybody who has faith at all um probably would get a lot out of watching a film like fanny alexander for a long time i used to say that fanny alexander was my number one film because it's very profound it's uh it's it, it's a deep uh mature work by a great uh director um these days uh i've only put it here at 23 because i'm less pretentious than i was i guess uh but it's still uh absolutely uh top notch and again this um if this was my me doing my kind of sight and sound uh top 100 as opposed to my personal favorite list this would go a lot higher you know because objectively speaking it's a it's a tremendous piece of work so 
let's uh, keep on going then, uh, because number 22 is Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, <clears throat> uh, a film I've seen hundreds of times, uh, childhood favorite, but also um, a really good film because under the surface it is, I can't use the D word, what can I say? It's not dark, it's, um, I mean, all right, there's a grim morality tale there in the Roald Dahl source material where Wonka is teaching these kids kind of, or their parents a lesson. So there's a very uh, sharp streak of kind of um, uh, strict moralism um, because all of these kids are horrible and they need to be taught a lesson. Uh, basically so so that's that part of it is good but the thing that makes uh willy wonka and the chocolate factory are the performances involved uh, now we've talked on this channel before about how problematic grandpa joe is okay grandpa joe is an absolute scumbag he is a freeloader he's been in bed for 20 years and he suddenly comes alive um so uh, you know let's leave that aside and talk about some of the other aspects of the um, film. One is the performance of Wilder himself. Wilder is so good as uh, Willy Wonka. He is mysterious. He is um, kind of unknowable. He's a little bit sinister. Um, what I really like about the performance is how indifferent he is to the suffering and the feelings of all the people around him. Um, you know, there's a moment where Augustus Gloop falls in the falls in the river. He's completely unconcerned. He doesn't give. He doesn't care at all. You know, and and I kind I kind of like that edge to the way that Wilder plays him. He's like, well, if this kid drowned, he wouldn't care. He'd care more about the chocolate than he would about the death of the child. That that makes that edginess makes uh, this particular Wonka character interesting. I mean, he's he's basically sociopathic. Um, you know, yeah, yes, there's the there's the kind of trippy, uh, uh, you know, the the, the the trippy weird. Uh, uh, what do they go on a boat? You know, the boat ride that they go on, and there's the chicken's head being lopped off and stuff. But uh, it's it's all the way through. It's it's the whole performance, um, and um, and then of course the uh, the amazing scene at the end where he's like, "You stole you stole fizzy lifting drinks." <laughs> so you're not going to you get nothing you lose good day sir um so so that's um he, he is he's just a, just amazing uh performance from gene uh wilder but then there's all the other people in the film as well one of the great performances in the film is veruca salt um you know the actress who plays her she is that she is a great spoiled child and then her father mr salt one of my favorite uh actors who crops up in um like old hammer horror films and basically loads of british movies his name was a uh, roy kinnear um he is tremendous he's like on career best form as mr salt you know very darling um amazing performance um i like uh i like the guy in the candy store you know the, the slightly creepy uh you know the candy man uh at the start um, one of the great performances of all time in any film, it's only a small part, is the teacher. It's uh, it's, it's the teacher at the start. Um, he's teaching the percentages and he's like, uh, how many chocolate bars did you open? And, and then he asked Charlie, uh, how many did you open? Two. He's like, two? I can't do two. And so he, gives a, he, he pretends he, he opened 200 chocolate. I love the Wonka teacher. Great, arrogant teacher um one of my all-time heroes uh, so um yeah willy wonka tremendous film um i really like it another thing i like about uh the uh, wonka is that it was clearly like a low but it was clearly like a b movie almost like a straight to video you know it's cl clearly nobody making it at the time thought it would become a cult classic and watched afterwards and I, I like that kind of I like that kind of uh, slightly low rent quality to the whole thing as well. Um, and some of the little bits they added, you know, the Slugworth character and the intrigue around it. Uh, great. Yeah. Really good film. Um, it's, it's just it's just wonderful. Just an absolutely wonderful film. And, uh, you know, they remade it, didn't they? They, they, they made uh, the one with Johnny Depp, which was an absolute disaster. 
disaster zone. So, uh, so anyway, yes. Um, and I, I'd also love to have um, uh, one of those machines, which you know, the, the good egg, the bad egg. I'd, I'd you know, I, I'd quite like to have one of those. One of my questions about it, though, is that when Veruca Salt is singing her song, um, one of the things she asks for is a bean feast. Now, what on earth is a bean feast? She says, I want a feast. I want a bean feast. Never understood what a bean feast is. So let's uh, carry on, shall we? Um, so, uh, yep. Uh, because number 21 is Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Um, another film set in the remote deep south, uh, obviously in Texas. Um, I actually went to Texas once and it, it, they genuinely does have bits which are creepy. I went to a, I went to this ghost town called Glen Rio, uh, once and it was, uh, well, it reminded me of a Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Um, and I remember the sign coming into Texas, it was sort of Texas. And it had these three burnt out chairs. It was like something, I, it was literally like something out of a horror movie. Um, and then in this place in Glen, this ghost town, there was like a skull in the yard, uh, like a cow skull and, you know, the baking sun and nobody was there. And then in the corner of my eye, saw a little flickering TV coming in from one of the rooms. And there was one guy living on his own in the ghost, in the ghost town. Oh, I never scarped as quickly in all my life. That was uh, that was genuinely scary. But anyway, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, um, absolutely stone cold classic horror film. Um, it's visceral. It's got it's uh, it's like a trip from, from start to finish. It's like uh, going on a thrill ride. Uh, genuinely scary in parts. Um, you know, it's not just Leatherface. It's the whole. It's this whole creepy family. Uh, you know, and the, and the weird. Uh, people they meet on the way and the, the kind of naivety of the kids um so uh yeah i i really like um uh texas chainsaw massacre obviously i've rated it as number 21 so let's have a quick pause for super chats um hopefully i haven't triggered too many people by uh uh some of these rankings american beauty was very unpopular i have to say i mean it's not that bad come on um so um George the Great and Powerful says, I kind of want to duck out and watch it, man. Damn it, AA. Well, you can always come back and watch it later. But I'd, I'd, I'd prefer it if you stuck around and sent me super chats. Um, <laughs> Tragic Vision says, Banjo scare me just because of that film. <laughs> um, well, um, or do, funny thing about banjos is that, um, you know, the comedian Frank Skinner, he is very big on banjos. And um, he actually got me into like a bit of banjo music because I used to listen to his radio show. Um, I stole Get Out from Frank Skinner because he always used to say at the end of his radio show and I kind of like it. So I, I took it for my for my channel. But um, Chris Primer says, oh, brother, where art thou? Have you seen it? Yes. Um, like I said, I, the soundtrack is really good. I love the old kind of prison songs and the... 1920s lead belly and uh delta blues and all that sort of stuff that's tremendous but um as for the film i could i could leave it uh federal reserve commit treason says one two girls and one cup best movie ever i haven't seen two girls and one cup what is it, it sounds like a sounds like a porn movie or something so um yeah all right uh shall we carry on then folks because it's time for the top 20 the top 20 are we ready let's do it let's do it number 20 is the godfather um now the godfather is an amazing film obviously everybody knows that um in fact it was so good that when i first watched it when i was a teenager um <laughs> i was so into it that when i came out i um I almost thought I was in that, you know, I was trying to recreate bits of it myself, you know, laughing as a laughing as a gangster at the time. Um, I absolutely loved it. Uh, and every time it's one of those things uh, that every time you watch it, you'll see something new in it. You'll see something different in it. Um, obviously, the acting is tremendous. You know, 
not just Brando, but it's Pacino and James Kahn and everybody in the movie is amazing. Um, the actual story itself uh, is interesting because it's a um, almost follows the plot of uh, King Lear. You know, you've got this father who wants to give away his kingdom and he's got these uh, obviously in King Lear, he's got three daughters. But in, uh, in The Godfather, he's got three sons. Who is he going to leave the kingdom to? Um, and uh, obviously, you know, uh, there's, there's a spot where uh, J- James Khan, uh, James Khan's character tries to take over, and uh, there's the whole sequence where Pacino goes to Italy, and there's Frido, of course. Um, just, just really good. Uh, don't know what much, much more to say about The Godfather. Uh, so many memorable moments. Well, one of my all-time favorite scenes in any, in any movie is. Um, the scene near the end where uh you where michael you know pacino's character he's uh he's in there with the turk and the and the bent cop and yeah you know he's going to shoot them and there's the train going in the background and his eyes are going and you're looking back and forth and his eyes are going and his eyes are looking back and forth and then he finally does i mean i love that's one of my favorite scenes in any in any film um just uh so good so yep um i uh i absolutely love the godfather um and uh it's one of the i haven't seen it for for a while for a long time i'd get it out like every two years or so and or you know it'd, it'd be on tv and i'd always watch it i probably haven't seen it for about five or six seven years now probably do a rewatch um but it's uh it's, it's just such a good film and um also interesting because um Vito, the Marlon Brando character, despite being the Godfather, is clearly a person we're meant to respect. He's clearly a hero in some way. Um, you know, given that he's a mafia boss, that's uh puts the viewer in a kind of interesting moral position as well. So that's what I like about the Godfather. Let's uh keep on going because number 19, another horror classic, Night of the Living Dead, um, one of the better mo- zombie movies ever made. Um, one of the things I really like about uh, Night of the Living Dead is that um, it's one of those films where nobody is likable in it. The, the 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 main the the lead the, the main uh, the lead character I, I think is a black guy um, in it, but he's not very likable. He's not like we're not quite rooting for him. We almost like want the people to die. Um, and as ever with the zombie movie, the the interest of the film. It's more about what's happening inside. It's more about the, the the kind of terse relationships of the people inside the barricade than what is, you know, than the actual zombies and the and the looming threat. Um, it's an interesting film about paranoia. It's an interesting film about. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I just think it's really and it it's very very well done. You know, on on a, on a, on, a, on next to no budget. Uh, now. Lots of uh, horror fans love George A. Romero, uh, and he made lots of these other, you know, Dawn of the Dead and all that. But to be honest, I don't like any of the other ones. I think they're rubbish. Um, Night of the Living Dead, though, is is absolutely fantastic. It re- really is good and um, uh, well worth watching uh, if you haven't watched it or, already. Um, I like the fact that there is nobody to root for, really. Um, you know, we, we kind of don't like the people. And uh, that makes it that makes it more interesting. So let's keep on going then, because number eighteen is Reservoir Dogs, uh, um, Tarantino, of course. Now I remember when this came out, and it was uh, you know I was only I wasn't that old in nineteen ninety two, but you know it it was a I remember it being a big kind of cultural thing, and then being a teenager. Uh, around you know in the subsequent years this would be one of the p- films to watch over and over again um yeah i mean it's cool it's still i i think it's still cool now you know you've got all the different uh all the different guys there mr blonde and mr pink and mr white and uh nice guy eddie and uh the one of the great performances of the film is uh is this guy here is joe he's such a grumpy old bastard and i i love the grumpiness of that performance um yeah, the um, Steve Buscemi, you know, is great as Mr. Pink. Uh, Michael Madsen is uh, such an evil prick as Mr. Blonde. Um, uh, yeah, I, it's, it's great. Uh, just, just a great, all about the dialogue, of course, in Tarantino. 
you know they have that whole conversation about Madonna's uh, Madonna be like um, being a virgin until she's uh, until she has sex with a black guy randomly. Um, just incidental dialogue. Um, I mean, what's interesting about uh, Reservoir Dogs is that it's like a donut. I mean, I don't know if you noticed, but the the central action of the um, of the film uh, is missing. What we get, so so the, the the main thing that happens is that there's a there's a heist that's it's a it's a robbery gone wrong, um, but we don't see the actual heist. What we see is flashbacks to beforehand, the aftermath and the fallout, but we never see the thing itself. So that's kind of a interesting writing technique that Tarantino uses. It's like a donut. Um, so that's uh, that's interesting, I guess. Um, too but uh it really is just kind of you know it is what it is i i think tarantino is all about the style it's all about coolness it's all about the surfaces um witty dialogue um i don't know if it's trying to say anything deep or meaningful or profound because it's meant to work at the level of kind of schlock because that's the level of tarantino but i like that because i'm perfectly comfortable with uh, postmodern texts so so there we go uh so yeah i just think the rest of our dogs is a ton of fun really ton of fun so um number 17 uh i mentioned shane meadows before of this is england his best film uh, in my view by some distance is this one dead men's shoes i mean we've talked about bullying um this is uh this has some uh really disturbing scenes of bullying in it um it is uh haunting it will stay with you um Paddy Considine uh, is one of the great actors of our time, I, I would say. I mean, I have never seen him be in anything where he wasn't anything. I mean, he's just a tremendous actor. Um, this is a fantastic film. One of the um, one of the scenes that always sticks with me is the that the um, is that there's a like a disabled guy in this, and the way that he is the way that he is taken advantage of is is really quite sickening. I would say. Um, one of the things I like about Dead Men's Shoes is how it um, how it depicts kind of group mentalities, how it shows how certain people, when they become like a minion, when they become like part of a group, how they lose their sense of um, how they lose their sense of like what's decent and what's right and so on, um, as long as they're willing to go along with the crowd type of thing that is a theme that i find interesting um i mean it's, it's one of those things i mean I, I often think about how academics are a bit like that they're so willing to go along with you know whatever's trendy right now but in the process they kind of lose their soul and there's something there's something of that in the uh, in what happens in dead men's shoes so if you haven't seen i don't want to give too much of the what happens in it away but dead men's shoes is a uh, absolutely absolutely i mean it's uncomfortable but it's um it's brilliant i think well probably in t in terms of british movies one of the best british films of the past 20 30 years something like that so um let's uh let's keep on going uh number 16 is the shining uh another stanley kubrick film kubrick has made a, a lot of uh you know he's he's racked up a lot of uh films on this list uh, which is impressive given that he only made i think he only made like 13 films but every single one of them was uh, special in some way and um the shining i mean wh what is there to say that hasn't been said i mean it's creepy it's uh it's uh scary uh the first time i watched uh the shining i was obviously too young to watch it because i was 14 and it was on my own television in my own room and um it was on at like 11 o'clock and i watched it on my own uh, when I was 14 and, um, I was probably traumatized, but I mean, it's, it was, I mean, to watch it when you're 14 alone, uh, probably psychologically scarred because <laughs> it's so, I mean, that, you know, the, it, it's, uh, unsettling. Um, one of the things I love about the shining is the, uh, is obviously the essential performance of Jack Nicholson. Um, what's, interesting about it is that he's clearly gone he's clearly not right as the film starts you know you see him even before they go to the hotel this guy is not right i mean if you saw a guy who looked like that 
um, walking in the street, you'd wonder why, like, should he be allowed out, you know? So that's one of the things he's clearly already not with it before they go. And that's something that I've always found kind of fascinating about what happens in the in The Shining. Um, Shelley Duvall is really good. I mean, famously, they said that she was never she was never quite right after making this film. Um, but she's very good uh, in it. And, you know, it's tricky with the uh, kid actors, but whoever the kid is, is, is pretty good in it as well. So, uh, yes, um, re- it's a uh, it's a great uh, it's a great uh, film. Um, I, I seem to remember uh, reading somewhere that um, Stephen King never liked it. I mean, I, I don't really care. You know, I don't really, Stephen King is one of these people somehow who has had loads of his books turned into like very good films. But I don't know like how good a writer he is himself. Um, I think a lot of the artistry here was probably coming from the Kubrick side rather than the Stephen King side, to be honest. All work and no play makes Jack a very dull boy, yes. Um, yeah, so, um, yep, Red Rum, all the rest of it, uh, Shining. And uh, I love the uh, I love the pullout at the end. I love the little picture and the, um, the kind of uh, when they're going into the into the kind of ballroom and it, the, the vibe of it is so, so good, so well done. Um, so The Shining, basically a perfect, basically a perfect film in my view number 15 um one of my uh one of my absolutely um famous uh picks is uh nuts in may <laughs> uh it's my uh it's my ambition it's my dream and ambition to get enough people to watch this film for the guardian to write an article to say why has nuts in may become an alt-right uh, you know why are alt-right trolls watching nuts in may you know this is this is what i want my ultimate dream is for nuts in may to be condemned by the guardian because it's been picked up by the right wing um to me uh it's a it's a very uh funny uh comedy it's a look at this uh impossibly middle class couple keith and candice marie who've got all these uh, kind of right on values um i just i mean i just love the character of keith I love how I just love how autistic he is and spooky he is about everything. Um, <laughs> I mean, even in even in this little scene now, have you <laughs> have you seen my uh, minimum maximum thermometer? <laughs> so I, I I don't know. There's something about nuts in May. I really I can't get enough of it. Um, it's my dream and ambition to get all of my like all forty thousand people sub to this channel to watch nuts in May at least once, and then for enough people to talk about it for the for the Guardian to write about it um it's so good yeah get pjw to do a review of it yeah that would be well froggy if you're watching this you're the one who's got it in with pjw so uh so so there, so there we go um <laughs> right so um so yeah uh, i i know i would talk about more about nuts in may um but uh, probably my video on the middle class uh has got enough eyeballs on nuts in may recently but um, yeah, I also think that Candice Marie. Um, I mean, one thing I one one of the little things I love about Nuts in May is that even though Keith seems like he's the one who's in charge, it's really Candice Marie who's pushing him. She's the one who's needling, and she gets under his skin, and she kind of it's not fair, Keith. Go on, go away, go and have a word. Didn't take a blind bit of notice, Keith. And she's just, she's just kind of playing with him, and then she's like, "Oh, I go and see." It. Like she, she wants to go and see Ray, and she uh, kind of makes him jealous. And she, it's really. I mean, I love the kind of subtle. I'm always interested in that idea that the, you know, between um, the ostensibly dominant one and the ostensibly submissive one, it's actually the submissive one who has secret control. And Candice Marie is uh, has that, you know, she she is really the one who's driving the show between the two of them, and she plays Keith a lot um, during it. You know, she works a little, she works a little rivalry between Keith and uh, Keith and Ray, and yeah. So I love the uh, kind of subtleties of Nuts in May as well. And every once in a while, I'll get that out to uh, 
cheer myself up a bit. I, I watched it over Christmas again uh, with Mrs. AA, who was like, what, again? You want to watch Nuts in May again? But then she didn't regret it. She was like, oh, yeah, it's really good. So um, number 14, fantastic uh, movie, uh, which I watched. Again, another film from 2000, look, Battle Royale, featuring one of my all-time, my all-time favorite characters, which is the teacher there, right in the middle. I love the rant the teacher goes on at the start. It's one, it's one of the all-time grumpy old men against the world, against the youth. I mean, I, you know, I've always hated the youth, as as people know. I hate the youth. And the rant that teacher goes on at the start is, I mean, one of my all-time favorite things in any movie ever is the teacher uh, in Battle Royale. But then, of course, the setup is they're gonna they're gonna have this uh, fight to the death, and it's just uh, it's just amazing. I, I I didn't know anything about this. It came on on like Channel Four, um, you know, at some time in two thousand and two or something. They just randomly showed it, and um, I couldn't believe how good it was when I when I saw it. And it was one of those things. I mean, back then everything wasn't online, and you weren't always in touch with everyone. And I couldn't believe how good it was. And it was only years later I found out that, you know, this movie had something of a cult following and uh, I could speak to other people who liked it as well. So, um, yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. Yes. It, I did hate the youth when I was a youth. Uh, yes. And it is my only Japanese film. It is. It's my only Japanese. It, unless you can't marry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence, which was co-funded by uh, it was a joint British uh, Japanese production. Which is not to say that there aren't good. I mean, if I was making a sight and sound style list, um, I'd put some Kurosawa on there, you know, Ran or uh, Throne of Blood or something like that. They're a little bit slow going. I also like um, Rashomon. Uh, Rashomon is a really good film, um, which is, I mean, if you were going to do an interesting film double bill, you could do uh, Citizen Kane or Rashomon back to back because they both do that thing where they play with uh they play with narrative they play with different perspectives on the same on the same thing so um you know there are some tremendous i mean audition is a great movie i haven't put on the list um i, I mean audition is the only film that i've ever actually thrown up during i, I actually w i had to stop the film and i was sick in the toilet watching audition because it made me that na nauseous um so there you know i mean there's a there's a there's some great japanese uh j horror you know the uh the uh the grudge is a, is a is a spooky spooky movie but um you know there are only 100 spots on the list and there were there were other picks that i wanted to feature instead um but battle royale is one of my all it's so much fun it's so i love it um i love its indifference i, I love its indifference to the suffering like it, it's just so brutal um, and it's so unapologetic for itself. Uh, so yes, I, I, I love the film for all, for all those reasons. And, uh, like I said, that teacher is one of my absolute, uh, all time favorite uh, characters in anything as well. Um, so let's, uh, keep on going because number 13, uh, is another one of my all time favorites. Uh, well, we're getting into big boy territory now. These are films I really love. Um, and this is Alfred Hitchcock's, uh, Rope. Uh, the only Hitchcock movie I put on, and it's not, uh, I mean, I love a lot of Hitchcock's film. I love North by Northwest and Vertigo and Rear Window and uh, Die Lem for Murder. You know, there's that amazing scene at the end where he uh, combs his moustache. I mean, Hitchcock's amazing. Uh, Psycho is uh, good, apart from the, um, apart from like the last five minutes, which I hate, but uh, Psycho is great. But um, Rope is the one of Hitchcock's that I really, really love because, um, the setup is these two gentlemen that you're seeing here, uh, their, their name is, uh, the one holding up the, the glass is uh, Brandon and the guy next to him is Philip. And um, the idea, they've been reading a lot of Nietzsche or some philosopher like Nietzsche. It's never, it's not actually said, but it's strongly suggested they've been reading Nietzsche. And um, they've got this idea into their heads that they are superior uh, to their classmate. They're superior to their fellow human beings, these two. And um, they they have this professor who they really like, who's played by uh, James Stewart in the film, uh, playing against type uh, in, in, in many ways. Um, and James Stewart is very good. Um, but anyway, this uh, this guy, Brandon, 
he he does he thinks that the professor is too theoretical uh, with all of his with all of these kind of Nietzschean ideas, and he wants to put the ideas into practice. So they they hatch a plan that they're going to kill their classmate David. Um, and this is not a spoiler because it happens like in the first second of the film. They kill their classmate David, and then to make the perfect crime, they're going to invite all his friends and family to basically have a dinner party while he's dead there in the room. And that is what happens in Rope. Uh, one of the reasons that Rope is famous is because um, the uh, whole the whole film is just one tracking shot. I, I mean, uh, Hitchcock couldn't actually he couldn't actually uh, find tape long enough to do the whole thing. So there are a couple of edit points, and it's usually where you see it, like he'll zoom into somebody's back or something like that. But still, the whole thing is what it, you know. You watch it, and it's all as if it, it's as if it's all one take. Um, and it's uh, I mean it's it's a play essentially. It's, it's a very talky film, but it, I I really like it. I really love um, the cine, the kind of um, it, Brandon is an aesthete, and he he wants to he, he has a complete disregard for uh, kind of morality or people's lives or anything like this. And um, yeah, I mean, if I was going to make my great villains list, Brandon from Rope would be in there. Because he's, uh, I mean, he's a magnificent prick as well, and I love, I love that about him. The other guy, Philip, uh, he he can't really handle it as well. Um, and there's a kind, of, I mean, it's hinted at that these two may be gay as well, possibly. Um, but uh, he struggles a lot with it, and he's he's very guilty and he's shaky. But Brandon is like effortlessly cool all the way through it. Um, yeah, so rope is a rope is a great. It's not like a reverse suspense film. It's like it's not like a. It's more the threat of people finding out about what they've done through through it. So that makes it uh, that makes it great. I think the script is uh, very good as well. I think the, the writer was Patrick Hamilton. So let's uh, keep on going because uh, number twelve, uh, we're at the business end now. Is uh, American Psycho another really good film? Um, I think this was the role that Christ, uh, Christian Bale was born to play. I mean, he's so good. Another film from 2000, look. I mean, maybe 2000 was the best year for film of all time. I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of 2000 films. But uh, basically perfect uh, rendition of um, uh, Patrick Bateman. Um, one of the things I like about American Psycho is that uh, you're never quite sure if anything you're seeing is real or not. Maybe it's just his kind of lurid imagination. Uh, maybe he's just fantasizing at his desk. Maybe it did happen. Maybe it didn't. Um, what I mean, it's got scenes that I love the scene where he just um, randomly kills that tramp just for, just because he can. I mean, I mean, it's uh, it's kind of uh, uh, you know, <laughs> um, dialogue is amazing. The uh, the the scene where he, the uh, you know he's uh, looking at the guys. Um, no, they whip out the business cards. That's 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 incredible. Cool it with the anti cool it with the anti-Semitic remarks. <laughs> um, just a, just a great film in all in all ways. Uh, iconic scenes, um, and I've just noticed a female director. So there we go. Uh, I really like American Psycho. Um, I I don't know why it wasn't more highly rated when it came out. I seem to remember I had a lot of like three and four star reviews. I mean, why? <laughs> it should have five star reviews. So uh, yeah, I think American Psycho uh, stood the test of time. Um, terrific performance, and uh, yeah, I, I kind of kind of interesting uh, look at a uh, certain type of corporate mindset, I guess. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the the there's a novel um, which is quite disturbing, uh, where even more kind of uh, obscene things happen um, that I uh, I wouldn't recommend. I probably I prefer the film to the novel. I think uh, not that I read novels, of course. So let's keep on going. Um, Pop Fiction is number uh, eleven. Um, another uh, great film from Tarantino, of course. One of the things I think is underrated about Pulp Fiction is just how funny it is. It's a it's a really really funny film. Hilarious. I mean, the, some of the memorable moments in it everybody uh everybody quotes but um 
it's just so funny. So many, so many hilarious things uh, happen in it. Um, uh, again, great script. The uh, all you know, Royale with cheese, all the rest of it. Um, I mean, what more can be said? So I, I, I still really rate the Tarantino stuff. Um, and I don't see why I don't see why anybody wouldn't. Um, I mean, if you want, again, it's all it's all the kind of cool surfaces. It's all about the witty dialogue and and the funniness. Um, if you're looking for like something deep and profound, you go and watch the Ingmar Bergman film. You know, go and watch Fanny Alexander. Not what I'm looking for from Tarantino. So uh, so there we go. So let's um have a look at the super chats then. Uh, just just two that i can see architect of fate says if blazing saddles is not on this list you can get out now it is proof comedy and moral principles can save any society i mean i do like blazing saddles but it's not on the list i'm afraid uh, i do like it don't get me wrong but it's just you know there were 100 other films i wanted to pick Gandhi bob flanker says have you seen the old bbc dramatization of tinker taylor soldier spy and smiley's people it's right up your street. Alec, Alec Guinness is brilliant. Um, actually, I haven't. I read a lot about it because do you remember when uh, Tinker Taylor Soldier Spy came out again? Um, th there was a lot of there was a lot of talk of that older one. Um, but uh, no, I haven't seen them. So uh, it's on my to been on my to do list. Uh, but to be honest, these past few years, I've been less inclined to. I went through a long period of not being able to watch any films. You know, I'd get I'd, put, I'd get up Netflix or I'd go through, and I was like, I can't be bothered. I'd, I'd rather do something else. Um, it's only been recently that my uh, kind of love for film has been reignited, I guess. Um, uh, and I'm trying to think of what kickstarted that. What was it? I watched something and I thought, oh, that's really good. Uh, wasn't wasn't the last Star Wars? I'll tell you that much. <laughs> Okay, so let's uh, let's uh, hit the top ten then, shall we? We've made very good time, haven't we? We're we're still uh, still less than two hours in. So uh, let's have a look. Uh, okay, top ten time. Number ten is Frank Darabont's The Mist. I think another. I, I want to say Stephen King wrote this as well, but. Uh, and another film from 2007. Now, The Mist, for me, remember what I was saying in um, Night of the Living Dead about how the real enemy is the enemy within, not the en enemy without? Well, The Mist is one of the ultimate films for this because there are all these, uh, this mist comes over this town and there are all these kind of weird creatures in the mist. Um, and they, uh, this town ends up getting like uh, trapped in this supermarket uh, obviously, they've got food and stuff around them. Um, but then, obviously, the question within the supermarket comes about, well, how are we going to deal with this? What are we going to do? And this is what I like. I like the pressure cooker atmosphere of what happens within that supermarket. The political questions that come up, some of the religious questions that come up, but also just the nature of man, the nature of the people. That ultimately they're all really just out for their survival and some of these baser instincts coming out in you know so it's the horror within rather than the horror out there so that's one of the things i really like about the mist the other thing i really about like about the mist and i don't want to give away what happens uh in it um i just love the end the ending is unbelievably bleak it is I mean, it's just beyond. It's staggeringly. Uh, it's it's one of the most horrendous things that I can think of that happens in any film. Um, and uh, yeah, I love the misfits as well. So for me, uh, and this will be controversial. I think the mist is the best horror film. I mean, I I mean, I'd happily argue that ever made. But uh, I'd certainly argue for the past like 30 years, 40 years or something like that. Um, I really think The Mist did not get the plaudits it deserved at the time. And uh, I mean, I don't know, maybe maybe since I haven't really looked, to be honest, but um, I'd imagine it still hasn't really been given its due. Uh, I always a masterpiece and I, I, I continue to I continue to believe um, 
that uh, that it's, it's maybe one day, maybe one day, will p- people will realise uh, what I'm saying um, about about uh, about uh, this. So my pick for the best horror, um, it's certainly a, certainly of recent years, but possibly also of all time. Number nine. Another film from 2007 is P.T. Anderson's uh, fantastic uh, There Will Be Blood. And uh, this would have been my pick for the best Oscar picture that year as well. It lost out to No Country for Old Men. Um, I mean, how good is There Will Be Blood? Um, Again, do you remember what I was saying about the duel of wits, the duel of wills? Well, it's the the duel between these two characters here, the uh, Daniel Plainview, the capitalist uh kind of evil capitalist versus the the culty religious guy on the left here um i forget the s actor this is named paul dano i want to say he he is very good at playing a wormy little kind of he is so detestable the paul dano character and there will be blood and it's interesting because the plain view character is obviously a bastard as well so it's this it's this duel of wills, this duel between two people who we don't like. We don't like either of them, but they're both really fascinating characters. Um, that's the heart of There Will Be Blood. But also the the you know I like the some of the big performances. Um, Daniel Day Lewis, who's again one of the best actors, uh, you know, in movie history without doubt, and he's been good in lots of. He was great in The Crucible. He was great in. Um, he was great in um, uh, my Le- my left foot. He was great in. I mean, he's basically good in everything. Uh, I didn't like Lincoln that much, but he, he's he's basically good in everything he's ever been in. Um, but uh, to me, this is his best performance. Uh, there, there will be blood. Um, of course, you know, I drink your milkshake and uh, drainage and all the rest of it. Um, it's so good. I can't get a. I can't get enough of it. Um, I also love the, I also love the spiel he goes on, you know, um, I want no one else to succeed. I have a competition in me. I hate most people. It's just so, it's so good. Um, one of my, uh, one of my favorite films ever. Um, and I said, I said at the time when, when there will be blood came out, uh, some people didn't like it. And I said, trust me, in 20 years time when people look back at this decade they'll say this was the film of this decade and when and in and in uh, 20 or 30 years time people will look back and they'll start putting their like, top 100 of all time lists af you know it, all time type lists it will and i've looked and there will be blood has acquired this sort of status since um 2007 so partly i'm i'm happy that i uh, made a correct call back in 2007 um but uh yeah i stand by my asset and one of the other things is that um uh pt anderson's direction in the film is interesting too um now th- there's a there's a bbc critic who i used to listen to quite a lot called mark commode who is um who is uh i mean he's a leftist let's 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 face it like a marxist basically um and uh, somebody told me that um they found like an old uh, introduction that Mark Commode had done to um, my hundred pick, you know, in the company of men, and it was all like intersectionality and all this stuff. I mean, okay, but that doesn't mean to say he's never said anything worth listening to about film. And I remember that um, back at this time when he was talking about uh, there will be blood, he was talking about how Pete Anderson kind of reimagined a um, uh, uh, cinematic narrative in this film. He was doing something new in the way that he told this story in the way that it was shot in the way that the sound works in the film so it's really interesting from that point of view as well so i very rate uh, i rate this film extremely highly uh, there will be blood number eight is uh the godfather part two now um i rated this high, i mean the, the placements would suggest that i rate uh, godfather 2 a lot higher than godfather 1 that's not the case at all i think the godfather the first godfather is a amazing film basically all of the films uh in this like maybe in the top 40 are 
spectacular movies. You know, we're we're at the we're at the stage now where even though a, one film is twenty and the other one is eight, that that doesn't mean anything. It's not a knock on the one that's twenty. It just means I wanted to mention like ten other films in between. Um, the reason I put Godfather two here is um is because I really like the narrative arc um and the journey that Michael Corleone goes on um um as the film and and you've got the dual narrative of the rise of Vito Corleone um and the kind of internal demise so even though Michael Corleone in material terms is going up his soul is dying you know um and um it's so the parallel in Godfather 2 is Vito Corleone who is essentially an honorable character he's kind of like i said he's a hero he you know we're meant to like him he is somebody who is using corruption to gain power okay that's his arc but michael corleone's uh, arc is that lord acting thing it is how absolute power corrupts absolutely so we're seeing how michael Co- how pa- how while vito is using corruption to gain power michael is being has power and is being absolutely corrupted by it um now i mean i don't know about spoiler i mean if you haven't seen godfather part two at this point sort your life out but obviously uh michael does one of the worst things you can possibly do to you know um as a human being in this film uh unimaginable and um one of my favorite uh shots in movie history is the is the is when he's just sitting on that bench alone at the end sad with nothing but kind of his own memories to haunt him yes he's the godfather yes he you know he's but ultimately he's got nothing um and i love i love the kind of hollowness uh and um in terms of career performances obviously pacino's had loads of them but i think he is absolutely phenomenal in godfather part um two um and loads of other cool things happen in it as well hyman roth is a great character and there's the whole thing about uh you know what's his name frankie the guy who um the guy who ends up giving himself the roman uh the roman suicide um so yeah godfather two uh obviously a great movie um number seven Another one of my favorite themes, as I've talked about, is uh, the duels, duels of wits, duels of uh, psychological battles between two uh, male protagonists. And here in Sleuth, we have the ultimate version of that. Um, uh, This guy on the right, played by Laurence Olivier. Now, for me, Laurence Olivier is quite a hammy actor in a lot of things. I don't I don't really like I don't really love him. As a Shakespearean actor, I could take or leave his Hamlet or the uh, the Richard the Third and all the rest. So I don't really care for all that sort of stuff. He's good in uh, the Entertainer, the John Osborne uh, film. Uh, uh, he's good in that. But uh, for me, his career best performance is uh, he's good in Marathon Man. But he's good. His best performance ever is in this film for me, uh, Sleuth, as this um, this uh, detective novelist um milo tyndall and the whole setup here is that um milo is a uh, is this aging novelist who lives in this big country mansion and he's obsessed with games he's obsessed with uh toys and games and he's got all sorts of weird kind of figurines and games from all around the world um and uh his wife is a woman of very expensive tastes but she has been cheating on him with a much younger man played by Michael Caine. And uh, so the setup of the film is that um, Milo, um, I don't know, Michael Caine's character is called Andrew. Uh, Milo invites Andrew to come to his mansion um, because he's got a proposal for him. And I won't say any more than that because uh, part of the thriller, I mean, it's a bit of a whodunit type thing. It's a, like a mystery uh, setup. Um, but, uh, Anyway, it it becomes quickly clear that he has got. It's not just the proposal he's there for. Um, there are some 
other aspects of gamesmanship involved. And um, the whole the whole film is watching these two men trying to demonstrate their masculinity to each other, trying to um, one up the other and um, playing kind of very dangerous psychological games with each other, trying to break each other. And um, I find that a very uh, interesting theme uh, to uh, play out. Um, so yes, it's, uh, and uh, this uh, director here, Joseph L. Mankiewicz, he's, I mean, people don't really talk about him, but I think he's directed a lot of good films. And his uh, direction in this film is especially, it's kind of witty, you know, there's a lot of witty, little witty little kind of visual jokes that are told um, uh, in, in, in the way that he makes this. But uh, the central performance is, I mean, Michael Caine is really good in the, uh, I think they were both nominated for Oscars for this film. It's, I think it's the only film ever where both actors were nominated for Best Oscar. Um, but they both lost out, of course, to Marlon Brando for The Godfather in 1972. So um, that's what happened there. But I, I really rate Sleuth. It was another one of those films that I watched when I was a teenager on my own, uh, randomly came on Channel 4 one night, and I just thought, wow, this is uh, this is something, this film. Um, but I've gone back to it, and there's so many, one of my all-time favorite um, sequences in every in any film is the is the rant that um milo's character gives to andrew you know he's like um he was like but why andrew but why um it's because i hate you i hate you because you're not one of me you're a blue-eyed culling wop a jumped up pantry boy who never knew his place i mean it's so good it's unreal so uh yeah sleuth amazing and uh, clearly Morrissey was a fan of this film because he quotes that, you know, the, the jumped up pantry boy who never knew his place. Uh, that's in a Smith song as well. So let's keep on going because number six, uh, another uh, kind of essentially a play that's been turned into a movie just like Sleuth was uh, and Rope is um, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. Uh, another Pacino film. Pacino is in this film. Kevin Spacey's there as well. Alec Baldwin, of course. Um, now this film is awesome it is an ensemble piece um and uh alec baldwin character here he comes in at the start and um they're all salesmen they're real estate salesmen and he, he says listen you're all fired um um the top two like the top guy gets a car second guy gets a set of steak knives everybody else is fired um and then you watch the pressure cooker of all of these guys fighting to keep their jobs. That's the, that's the movie. Um, what I love about it is the, uh, it's got so, I mean, for me, it's probably the most masculine film ever made. Um, it is, I mean, it's a pure, uh, it's a pure look at um, the, the male ego, I guess. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's, uh, it's all about, um, what it is that makes men men specifically not women men uh, i don't think there are any women in the actual film at all uh from, from what i can remember um and uh that there's a there's a sense of high i mean you could probably rank like rank the characters in terms of their hierarchy um you know that clearly the alpha is uh the, the al pacino character uh R ricky roma um but then there's the uh, there's a very clear beta in the film played by ed harris um then the, the Alan Arkin is in the film, a d decent actor as well. Um, and uh, but for me, the star of this movie is Jack Lemon. Jack Lemon is so good in this film. The bitterness in it, like the desperation that reeks uh, from uh, his portrayal of Shelley Devine in this film is is something else. Um, and there are so many just cold moments cold cold moments um you know i, I posted a, i posted uh i posted a, a bit on this uh on twitter the other day and um um morgoth just said this film is so bleak i can't believe it um but i just i just love it i can't i can't get uh enough of uh glenn gary glenn ross the um the 
I mean, it's all about the it's all about that little sense of like who who, who is where in the pack, in the hierarchy, who is going to be the alpha here, who is going to, and it's um it's just raw. That's why I love about the it's just so relentless in its focus on that. Um, uh, Alec Baldwin, that I mean, he's only in one scene, and it was written specially. It's not in the play. It's only. Uh, David Mamet wrote it especially uh, just for Baldwin to come in and give that. He, that I mean, that's just one of the all-time great uh, things. Uh, Pacino is great as well in the film. I mean, um, he has a rant at one point uh, where he calls uh, Kevin Spacey a fairy. You fairy, you child, company man. Um, so good. I can't. Ed Harris is good. Um, every, everything is so good. Um, so uh yeah i would um i would strongly recommend glenn gary glenn ross um i also um i also just love um the um one of the one of the interesting uh dynamics in it is is that you feel for jack lemon's character because of the you know, there's an awful lot of pathos there you 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 really think oh god but he's also a he's also a detestable prick you know whenever he's on top whenever he gets a little bit of victory then he starts to try to put other people down that's the that's the thing it kind of unveils like anybody anytime anybody's on top you see their true colors in the film and you see that in the jack lemon character as well so it doesn't allow you really to really to like him he, he kind of deserve what he deserve what you know um the, the the other thing I'll say is that there's a there's a there's an amazing moment in the film where um towards the end where uh, Jack Lemon gives uh, Pacino a, a look and um just the look just the just the what is exchanged non verbally in that moment uh you know again again one of my favorite little moments in any in any film ever so number six Glen Gary Glen Ross. Number five uh, is another Kubrick uh, film, and uh, one of my all-time. I mean, obviously, it's number five. Just a, I can't get enough of Clockwork Orange. I saw it another one of these films I saw when I was a teenager. Of course, it was banned for many years in the UK, and I want to say that I want to say it was unbanned relatively recently. It was like banned for like thirty years. So let's see. It would have come back out in the 90s because it was a big deal when I was a teenager that Clockwork Orange was going to come out on DVD and finally we could watch it and all this. It was going to come out on video or something. And it was um, it was going to be shown on TV for the first time ever or all this sort of stuff because it was banned. Um, but, but anyway, um, uh, why, why do I love Clockwork Orange? Uh, well, aesthetically, obviously, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a cool film. Um, but again, it's this it's this exploration of the nature of evil and the fact that Alex um, is doing all of these things by choice. It's not a compulsion. Like he knows it's wrong and yet he chooses to do it anyway. So that, that is an interesting thing. And obviously the, um, the, the writer Anthony Burgess is Catholic. So there, there's quite a lot of, um, there's quite a kind of religious questions and the nature of morality and stuff uh, being asked as well. But there are other reasons to love Clockwork Orange uh, beyond just that, and beyond the you know I've talked about uh, Kubrick's obsessive kind of lens, you know the the slightly autistic lens that he looks at things through. I can you know, but beyond that, um, what about the uh, kind of slightly weird British Monty Python esque atmosphere of the whole thing? You know, one of the one of my favorite characters in it in it is that um is that kind of social worker who comes to see him at the start, um and I drive Mrs. A A nuts because I every once in a while we'll just be sitting there and I'll t and I'll start saying uh yes Alex boy Alex boy because I love I love the I just love the the uh sur slightly surreal nature of the of the British actors who who are in it and uh, a lot of these guys you'll recognize from uh, to, you know the dad's army or uh, various different um, kind of they were like regular actors from British TV and things and they're just kind of there um, Patrick McGee of course is in there Dave Prowse is there 
I mean, it's just so good. I can't, uh, I can't, uh, uh, quite put the words on why I uh, love Clock Orange uh, as much as I do. Um, another little theme of it that I like, I like the fact that the, the other droogies, you know, the tagalongs, the little, uh, the, 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 the minions, if you want, they end up becoming uh, cops. So it's just like, they're just like Alex, but they're on the other side now, you know? <laughs> um, yep. The, uh, the ultra violence, the, uh, yeah. So uh, let's keep on going. I mean, Clock I mean, what else is there to say? It's Clockwork Orange, for God's sake. Um, yeah, top uh, top film uh, for me. Number four, uh, you may recognize the guy on the left here. That's George Sanders. A lot of people say, where's your avatar from? It's from uh, my number four pick, All About Eve, another Joseph uh, L. Mankiewicz film from 1950. Um, I mean, what can I say about All About Eve? Uh Tremendous performances. I mean, George Sanders on career best form. I think he won. I think he won an Oscar uh, for best supporting actor for All About Eve. Um, but the film is all about the, the this woman you see on the right here. She plays Eve Harrington, and um, there's a there's a Betty Davis is in the film as well, and she plays uh, an old like an aging actress whose um, whose days as a kind of leading woman are drawing towards a close. And George Sanders is a very uh, influential theater critic called Addison DeWitt. Um, and, you know, the reason I picked him as my avatar is because it was a little nod. It was a little, just a little nod to uh, the, the, the fact that uh, I may also be a, a critic of some description. Um, so I, I um, and, and the fact that I think George Sanders is really cool. But um, the whole setup of the film is that uh, Eve Harrington is just this ambitious young girl who wants to get on, wants to get into acting. And she, um, she ostensibly, she, she starts out as a kind of, she just wants to be an assistant. Oh, I just want to help out, you know? Um, and she kind of stalks Betty Davis's character a little bit and she studies her. And, um, but it's clear that she's studying her because she wants to be, she wants to be in her place. And, um, it's a really interesting, it's really interesting because, um, I mean, I would, I've talked a lot about the male ego, but you see a lot of the female ego in this film, you know, the young, uh, you know, the young, glamorous rising star Eve and the old, uh, the, the older, uh, actress who's starting, you know, her looks are starting to go and she's starting to get worried about it and she doesn't want to lose her place. And, um, it's uh, it's really, it's really something. And uh, the Addison DeWitt character, George George, George Sanders' his character here, um, he is a very sinister presence in the film. He, he is basically evil, basically an evil character. I have not, uh, I mean, <laughs> wouldn't surprise people that I'd pick an evil character as my avatar as opposed to a goodie. But um, yeah, he he, he is he's quite, he'd be on my list of top villains ever in films because he plays like a kind of a uh, Svengali character behind the behind, like he's trying to walk. He wants, um, uh, Betty Davis's character is called Margot Chan. He wants Margot basically to, to shuffle off. And he wants Eve Harrington in her place because he, as a critic has got kind of some appreciation of, um, what Eve is up to. So I really like, uh, all about Eve. As with all of Joseph L. Mankiewicz's films, but especially uh, this one and Sleuth, the the script is so intelligent. It's, it's so sparkling wit, um, crisp delivery. Uh, you know, so it's um, and it, it's a film like this is one of the sorts of things that makes me wonder. Maybe Ed Dutton is right that people are getting more stupid as time goes on, because I don't think this film could be made today because half the audience wouldn't understand what was being said. Um, but anyway, all about Eve absolutely phenomenal movie um and uh well you can see i put it at number four here so number three uh another play um turned into a film uh this one uh, edward Elby's who's afraid of virginia wolf and um another aging aging kind of actress um um i, I, sh I should have mentioned betty betty davis is superb and all about eve as well but uh is elizabeth taylor uh, as um, as uh, what are their names? Martha, as Martha here, and uh, 
Richard Burton as George. Yeah. And of course, they were married in real life, uh, Burton and Taylor. And uh, famously, they were, you know, it was a rocky relationship. It was an explosive relationship, um, which made them basically perfect to play George and Martha in uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. Um, the acting is uh, phenomenal in this film. The uh, the script is uh, fizzing. And again, so all of these duels of wits and duels of wills we've been uh, talking about, you know, have tended to be two blokes. It's been like male versus male, or in the case of All About Eve, it's uh, woman versus woman. But in Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, it's a husband versus wife. You know, they are they're playing this these kind of really sick psychological games with each other. Um, uh, George is a is a kind of history professor. He's not doing that well in his career. Um, uh, his wife Martha is a very domineering woman. Uh, she's difficult. She's braying. Uh, she kind of cucks him. Uh, he is kind of like seething resentment uh, underneath it all. And um, a younger couple comes to kind of the, 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 a new guy has joined the, the college basically, and they've invited them over. And uh, they basically just have like the kind of party from hell, basically. Um, I love Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. It is, uh, I mean, it's it's a haunting film in many ways. Uh, like so many of these films, it's disturbing. But um, I really think it's uh, one of the best films ever made, obviously. Uh, hilariously, I once tried to watch it with my dad. And he was like, what are you trying to, what are you trying to make me watch here? <laughs> like it was wrong with you <laughs> um so uh that was funny but um but still uh uh who's afraid of virginia wolf uh strongly recommended if you've never seen it uh you really should um yeah basically the the, the ultimate uh the ultimate in uh couples fighting movie i guess um but really uh psychologically dark as well um uh, I mean, I don't want to give too much away. I mean, it's difficult to talk about these things without giving away major plot spoilers, so I won't. But um, there's something that the there's something that there's some kind of little secret that they've got between them. I'll just put it that way. And um, the way that that was played with in their various games is is really is really quite. Um, I hate to say it, it's dark. It's very dark. All right, number two. Everybody's been waiting for this. It's, of course, Labyrinth. Uh, I mean, how could I not put it uh, right at the top of my list here? Um, what can I say? I mean, I love David Bowie, um, but uh, I've seen this film hundreds of times. I've seen this film so often that um, you can put it on mute and I can fill the words in. You, you know, you, you know very well where he is. Time is short. You have 13 hours in which to solve the labyrinth before your baby brother becomes one of us forever. Such a pity. Um, so why do I love Labyrinth as, as much as I do, other than the fact that I've seen it so many times? Um, you know, what I like about it is that um, it's all about uh, Sarah on the right here. She, she thinks she's older than she is. She's a teenager. She's going through adolescence. And um, Jareth is, he's obviously too, it's obviously an adult situation and she is obviously still just a child. So she's trying to grow up too early. So it's kind of like a reverse buildings roman. So so in, in, in a normal buildings roman, you have a young character who goes through a journey and they discover that they, they, they kind of grow up on, on the course of the journey. Whereas uh, Labyrinth is almost like a reverse one. It's a, it is Sarah realizing that she's still just a kid ultimately, and she can't, she shouldn't be in these situations that are too much for them, and she needs to actually hold on to these childhood things. Um, so that's uh, that's really what uh, it, it, that's my reading of what uh, Labyrinth is about. Um, but what I mean, it's an interesting film because it's written by Terry Jones of Monty Python fame. So it's got all these like little bits of British humor all the way through it. It's a lot more comical and funny than uh, than you think of a fantasy film like this. And this is what I was saying about the Dark Crystal. The Dark Crystal is very straight, whereas the Labyrinth is very tongue in cheek. It's kind of, kind of the script is very sly. 
Um, and I, I love that about it. Um, you know, yeah, she comes to realize that she needs all her friends, Hoggle and Ludo and all the rest of them. And um, somewhat in that mood earlier on on Twitter, I sent out a tweet saying, listen, I, you know, I, I appreciate all my guys on here, even, even you, Mark. Um, so there's there's bits of that as well. Um, but of course, one of the key reasons to love this film is for the performance of David Bowie as the Goblin King, because he's sinister. He's kind of toys with this uh toys with this girl um i love all of the showdowns between jareth and sarah uh, from the minute that he presents her with a crystal at the start um to the the final showdown you know you have no power over me and all that uh it, it's uh it's it's great it really is great um i like the aesthetic i like the uh the animatron like the puppets the jim henson puppets and uh Little, little jokes as i said uh so labyrinth absolutely phenomenal now i haven't seen the labyrinth in some time because the last time i watched labyrinth i was in floods of tears at the end of it because it was the first time in so many times watching it that i had realized that it was just a dream like somebody said oh you, you realize it was just a dream i was like no and it floored me i mean i, mean, I was still i was i was like a 30 32 year old man at the time <laughs> which is pathetic to think about but um for some reason that hit me and um it's made me question like that does any of these things happen or is it just a dream or what but um the idea that it was just a dream was too much for me to bear on that occasion and i don't want to think about it so i haven't actually seen the labyrinth since then because <laughs> it, it meant too much so so there we go and uh any guessing what my number one is given where i've gone with my number two it is of course mary poppins um basically a practically perfect film in every way um probably the last great project disney worked worked on before he died uh bringing this um bringing this kind of old old uh morality tale to the screen um what can i say about it i mean julie andrews is absolutely i mean she couldn't have been they couldn't have picked a better person to play uh mary poppins but uh for me all of the action of the film is about is about this guy here, about Mr. Banks, the best character, my my all time hero, um, one of the all time best characters in any film is Mr. Banks. Um, you know he runs his uh he wants to run his home with tradition and discipline and rules, and uh, he he's a banker, and he uh, he's an Englishman in 1910, and he's got a very firm sense of himself. And um, I mean, to me, he's basically uh, amazing even before Poppins comes into it. But um, I think people misunderstand Mary Poppins. Um, some people have said that Mary Poppins is a critique of Western metaphysics, that um, it's a kind of critique of rationalism, that uh, you need more. You need to understand more about human nature. You need to understand more. You can't just have rationalism. And this is ultimately the... Um, the lesson that mary poppins wants to wants to teach the mr banks here she wants to teach him that um that you need more than just the system two thinking you need the system one two you need the you need the emotional brain you need to engage some part of um you need to have the intuition you need to have the yeah so you can't just have instrumental reason alone um so in that way you could say well mary poppins is almost like a kind of German idealist looking at a looking at a um, looking at a like a Jeremy Bentham type figure, you know, some, something like that. Almost kind of a, like a Nietzschean critique of Bentham or something like this, you could say. But, 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 having said all of that, it is still a conservative. It's a conservative film um, because, um, yes, the children. They, they, so at the start, Mr. Banks writes uh, a note about, uh, you know, the, what his perfect nanny would be. A nanny that should give commands. Um, but the kids also, they, they do their own kind of sacker and they, they want they want a nanny who's going to give them sweets and who's going to kind of have fun with them and this sort of thing. And one of the things that people don't, um, and, and uh, Mr. Banks, absolute Chad, just uh, rips it up and throws it in the bin. Um, but one of the things people don't appreciate is that uh, Mary Poppins, it, yes, she is the kid's perfect nanny, but
but she is also Mr. Banks's perfect nanny. She does give commands. She is disciplined. She does put her foot down. Um, she's basically the perfect Edwardian nanny. She just teaches the kids that, okay, you need to do tough things in life that you don't want to do. You need to clean up your room. We're gonna. When I say you're gonna go home, you're gonna go home. So she teaches them all sorts of discipline. If you remember, it's the the corrupting influence is Bert. Bert's the one who wants to stay with a tea party on the ceiling. He's the one who wants to stay. But she's like, no, it's time to go home. We're gonna go home now. And she sticks by the rules. She won't work on a day off. She won't. Um, you know, she she does everything by the book, uh, her own book. But she she sticks by, she sticks by her own rules. And um, that is something as well uh, that I think people, it's not just a, it's not a subversive uh, correction to Mr. Banks. It's just, he actually, actually adds something. She just says, look, you have to do all these things, but you take a spoonful of sugar as well, and it will help the medicine go down. But ultimately the medicine is important. All right. Thank you very much, everyone for watching my top hundred movies. I hope that was, uh, I hope that was, uh, um uh interesting for everyone uh yes i really love mary poppins it's i can't get enough of it um i love mary poppins so much that once uh when i was first started uh dating mrs <laughs> mrs a took me to a mary poppins party and um uh she went i went as mr banks and she went as poppins and um i couldn't uh i couldn't they actually put it on and i had to leave because I, because the emotion of it was too much for me. So it's, uh, you know, th these two films, the um, Poppins and Labyrinth, are uh, ones I've seen so much that they're almost, this, they're almost a part of, uh, they're almost like a part of me. So um, that's why I couldn't, I like, in good conscience, I couldn't not put them at the very top. Okay, so. <laughs> so people are saying i'm strangely emotional yeah there we go so people say i'm metrosexual I'm, come on now come on enough 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 so um let's uh let's have a look at um uh, any last uh super chats that have come in um uh charlemagne says i bought a copy of nuts in may on ebay charlemagne absolutely brilliant you need to get nuts in may into the distributor get the distributors to watch it get some of your alt right buddies to watch it i want everybody watching make a video about it on your channel like i want to all the edgy boys need to be watching nuts in may um silly sailor says if one isn't aa trolling i will be disappointed no i'm not trolling at all um mary poppins is my number one movie uh Sol and Victor says skipped out of work to cut early to catch the top 10. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean that's good dedication. I very much appreciate that you did that. Sol and Victor is the top is the top uh, AA fan for, for for actually leaving work early to catch the top 10. Greed uh the Abrisha says Labyrinth ain't number 1 third biscuit eater. Well it was number 2. I mean it was pretty high. And um, the Wooster says, based AA dabbing on everyone and realizing how great Mary Poppins actually is. I mean, it's it's just it's every it's all that and more. Mary Poppins is the best film. Is the, I mean, in terms of what it's trying to do, I don't know of a film that nails it quite as perfectly as it's basically a perfect film. Every single part of it is. I mean, I haven't even talked about like you know the uh, um, Admiral Boom and. Uh, Albert and the uh the you know mr just go and what i mean just go and watch that scene they go to the bank and um you know uh, they try to convince michael that he needs to invest his tuppence in the bank rather than feed the birds and the um the song that the uh the, the song that the bankers sing trying to convince him to invest the tuppence is phenomenal you know railways through africa do, 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 do. i mean it's, it's tremendous so um i can't uh i can't uh praise uh mary poppins anymore i've put it number one on my list uh, and I, I think uh, that'll do so get out some people see can't see past the end of their own nose <laughs>